Hello. Uh, Hello. Mithal, good morning. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Mithal, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm also good. And thanks for joining. Yeah. Yes, I'm good. Thanks for joining. Okay. So I am. I want to be the host for this meeting. Hello. Yeah, I, I'll be the host for this meeting. Uh, just one second. Um, hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. So um, we are. Yeah, organizing... I'm listening. Okay. So we are organizing this panel. So we would like to be host, or would you be uh, uh, designating people as panelists, etc.? So like, I would just be facilitating on the this, so you can host everything and um, um, be the moderator for the program and everything. But I would just assist people to join, assist people with some questions and answers. Then I so like all the if you are organizing, then everything is on you. Yeah. So um, no. So. Um... So you will handle when people come in, right? That's what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Just one second. Uh, I can make a co-host. I can make you a co-host. Co-host. Yes, yes, yes. So, so like I have make you a co-host now. Mm -hmm. You are now a co-host. Okay. Yeah. So you can. Handle it from here. Got it, got it. And when people come in, when people join, and they are speakers, so I will make them as panelists, right? Yes, and so so the um, I will put it in the um, chat panel that mm -hmm. all the panelists should um, so that we promote them to uh, the panelists and speakers list. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you, could you repeat, please? I said, um, so when when people attend, I'll put in the chat okay. that those people who are, yeah, who are panelists should kindly let me know so that we can in, invite them to the panelists list if they are still on um, at the list. Okay. Okay. Sure. Also, but I have the list, so I will also start designating them as panelists. Okay. 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 Yes. That is good. That is good. And one of my colleagues, Deepti, who has just joined in as a panelist, she also wants to be the co-host. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi, DP. DP I oh, sorry, hear. sorry, sorry. Who am I speaking with? Uh, my name is Salbi from Ghana. Okay, hi. I'm at the um, ITF volunteer, yeah. Okay. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Um, so we just wait for our participants and then we have the ability to start like designating them as panelists. Is that right? Yes, please. Yes. Please. Okay, great. Uh, Anushka, do you want to go ahead and start doing that? Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, Gianluca. So promote the panelist. Yeah, done. Stefania also is here. Um, could I ask if we have the ability to put on a virtual background? Uh, you are muted. No, I'm not. No, no, I mean, I was speaking to the uh, other co host. Okay. <laughs> Could we? Um, please. Yes, please. We could do that? Yes, please. 
Yeah. Hi, I'm Gianluca. Nice to Hi. meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I think that's uh, um, not the option, virtual background. I will try to find a neutral background, okay? Yeah, I think we were just trying to ask that uh, with our uh, tech moderator here. Ah, okay, you will do it for that. Yeah, yeah, we were just in the process of figuring that out. So we'll just get okay. back to you quickly. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, DP. Hi, Anushka, DP. Can you hear me? Hi, Paimander. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so let me start the video as well. Let me see what I should do here. Decide which video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can show it. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, that's why. Hi, Anushka. Hi, Deepti. Can you hear me? Yes, Nandini. We, I can hear you. Okay. Do you want me to test my video as well right now? Sure, sure you can. Yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, okay. Yes, I can see you. Yeah. Um, All right. Could Amen do the video play right now? I just wanted to check that. If he's I in. think he's not online yet. I just told him to get it. Yeah, he said he'll be here in two minutes, so we'll just do a sure. quick video play.
Hi, Baminda. You're muted. Ah, hi, yes, thank you. Hi, hi Yoklin, how are you? I'm fine, nice to thank see you. you. Yeah, good to see you too. I'm glad. Can you hear me, Yoklin? Yes, I can hear you very well. Just yeah, wanted to, yeah, to make yeah. sure that okay. I got it earlier. Where are you? Pena? You are in Malaysia? Uh, I'm, in Kuala, I'm in Kuala Lumpur. I'm in Kuala KL. Lumpur, right, yes. Yeah, that's why I'm in our okay. office here. Okay. Okay, okay. all right. I'm going to go on mute and stop the video until we start. Hi, Parminder. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you very well, Net. Hello, Net. Yes. Hello, Net. Hello, Hi. Net. Hi. Hi, welcome. How sorry to pull you out of your holiday. Oh, that's okay. I'm just at, I'm just here at home. Okay. We only okay. went out last weekend, but every day I'm here. Okay. How's We're, everything there? Hi, Sophia. So you I got have a, just woke up. I have you just, just woke, woke up. up. Yes, you have it's the freshest. Time. You have the freshest thoughts. Yes. No, no, I'm still sleepy. I'm dumb. <laughs> I need to wake up. My husband is preparing coffee. So, <laughs> where are you, Sophia? Argentina. Oh, oh my God, that's very early. Sorry. So yeah, so uh, Net and Sophia are here. We will go in the same um, uh, order as mentioned on the flyer, which I think is Net, Debra, uh, Nandini, and Sophia. Right, uh, Nandini? It's Debra, Sophia. And yeah, Net. that's right. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, sorry, I. That was. Okay, uh, th this confusion should Debra. have been there. Deepi, uh, I'm going by the flyer, not our internal script. No, no, as in the speaker order. Yeah. Yeah, speaker order on the flyer. I'm sorry, you were right. Uh, okay. Uh, 
uh, this is the first confusion which should not have come. Uh, Param, you can <laughs> just tell us the speaker order and now the order you prefer and we can go according uh, no, to I that. I thought it's on the flyer, but I agree. On the uh, flyer. There is one on script, but I'll just go as it's on the flyer, which we sent out, which is Neth, Debra, uh, Nandini and Sophia. Amay, are you in? Can we just test the videos once? Yeah, can you hear me? We're waiting for Deborah. I just uh, WhatsApped her, and uh, let me also try to call her. Hello, DC. Am I audible? We are just four minutes away. Two fifty. We start, and I hope. Am I audible? Yes. A little louder, perhaps. Okay, I'll reduce it. Um, could you maybe close your screen at the back? I think that's a little it's letting a bit light. The light is too much. Yeah. Okay, I'll try as well and then go off camera. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, Anusya. Thank you. Hi, Titi. So no worries. Uh, always useful to do a tech check. Hi, Anita. Hi, Param. Hi, Hi other friends. Okay, I'm going on mute then. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see you later. Um, can you guys see my screen by any chance? Um, maybe no, who's speaking? Ame, Ame. Okay, Ame. Ame, it's stuck. Your screen is stuck. At oh. least for me. 
Uh, we just two minutes. Uh, Debra is not come. And uh, okay, Debra. She's here. Debra is here. Okay, she's come. So yeah. So yeah, we we have a full panel. Uh, to the panelists, uh, Debra, can you do a mic check? Can you hear me now? Yes, you're loud Great. and clear. You can probably do a video check as well. Yes. Yes, yeah. let's do a video check. Yes. There. Oh, okay, I don't need to lean yes. in so much. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Welcome uh, Debra. Thanks. Uh, nice you have been able to be with us. And we'll follow the order I just uh, sent out, which would be mm -hmm. as on the flyer. Net, okay. Debra, Nandini, and uh, Sophia. And we start in uh, two minutes. I'll uh, just uh, give a background and then we start and we will still have a discussion time. We have 10 minutes for each. Uh, please try to stick to the time because our rolling program is very tight uh, for the next three hours. Um, Yes, Debra, that's beautiful. Good. That's nice. Um, okay. Deepti, Anushka, everything is well? Uh, we just have 10 minutes each, yeah? You have 10 minutes each, yes. And we have, a, as you have okay. seen, a long, long three-part program. So everything is very tight. So we okay. like to yeah, no problem. I don't have too much. Yeah, uh, all the panelists for session one are in, you may start, go ahead. Uh, I'll start at uh, 51 at least, I mean, just okay. to, uh, sure. you know, people just take one or two minutes. Uh, sure. coming yeah, of course. Starting. Yeah, one, two minutes is okay. Nice started. to see all of you. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, Deborah, always. <laughs> it's always nice to see each other, at least virtually. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you're clean. How are you? I'm fine. You're looking so glamorous. I think Europe, oh. agrees. Europe agrees with you. Don't go back to the US. <laughs> I'm going back next week. <laughs> oh my God. Then go yeah. back to a non Trump US at least. Oh. I'm hoping, man. Today's the day. Please wish us luck. Please send us all the good vibes. Well, we, are as, we are as worried as you are. <laughs> I'm sure. I think we're all going to be glued to the television to see the results. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really scary. So we'll see. It's, it's terrible that the election of one country and we are all looking at it like, yeah. oh my God, oh my God, what's going on? It shows how colonized we are. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully after this, it'll get better. So we do have... Uh, a total of uh, 40 people here. So I'm just waiting for it to strike 52 and I'll start. <laughs> I woke up at six and I saw all a whole bunch of mails from you guys. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, something's happening, something's happening. But no, it was all organization emails. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, friends, uh, let's uh, start. Uh, so welcome uh, the panelists and others who have come here from different paths. I know some from very difficult time zones. So this is an event being organized by IT for Change and JustNet Coalition or the other way around, JustNet Coalition and IT for Change. Uh, JustNet Coalition, as uh, many of you may know, is a global coalition of actors working on dig digital justice, uh, equity, social justice, economic justice, and data justice. Uh, it was set up in uh, 2014, and I'll be speaking a little more about it. Uh, IT for Change is an India-based NGO working on the intersection of digital technologies and social change from an equity and social justice uh, point of view. Uh, this event is in three parts. Uh, JustNet Coalition normally holds its annual meeting just before the 
internet governance forum meetings. It could not happen this time. We also hold a pre-event and this is that pre-event. Uh, we will hold a JustNet coalition meeting in the coming months over, uh, over a uh, video platform like this one. Uh, the first part is a meeting. We'll have four panelists who will speak about the future of digital justice networking in the new age. Uh, this is a hour and 10 minutes panel. It will be followed by the release of a digital new deal compendium where a lot of scholars, activists and practitioners have contributed their views about what does the future of digital justice uh, promise to be or could be. And the last part, we'll hear Professor Saskia Sesen uh, reflect on the digital context. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, the panelists would be able to comment on uh, Professor Sassin's uh, reflections. Uh, so we start the first session now, uh, which is uh, the future of uh, digital justice networking. And this session is placed in the history of JustNet Coalition, uh, which was formed in Feb 2014. And uh, its formative document was uh, is uh, the Delhi Declaration. And I would uh, uh, urge uh, you all to take a look at it at the JustNet Coalition website. Uh, it was born in conditions where the, some actors were very worried about democratic governance of the digital at a time an early time where people were only looking at what goodies does the digital give us and generally were happy to rely on self-governance, uh, which is basically corporate-led uh, governance as corporate was the biggest actor in the digital arena. And some actors who were more worried about democratic governance of this very powerful phenomenon got together uh, in this network. This network was also very special that it consisted of actors both from the digital arena and from various sectors which digital had started to impact, whether it's health, education, agriculture, climate uh, change, uh, or uh, workers' rights. Uh, you would be, we are, in, we are very glad that the Delhi Declaration contained ideas like social ownership of data and platforms as public utilities. Back in 2014, which is quite long way back, uh, especially in digital time, when these ideas now are being discussed in policy circles, including the US talking about uh, platforms being public uh, utilities and Europe talking about collective approaches to data, which we had envisaged six years back. Last year, we had another document, which is called Digital Justice Manifesto, which placed data and intelligence at the center of a new way the society and the economy is getting reorganized. So we just wanted uh, to show that how JustNet Coalition has been moving along with the times they have been providing cutting edge uh, work on the digital, uh, in the digital space. However, remaining very, very participative, participative and grounds up. And we would also discuss today, and that's the primary purpose of this uh, session, that going forward as the speed of change in the digital arena has greatly been enhanced uh, among others by the COVID phenomenon, uh, where do we stand today in terms of how social justice actors should network in terms of digital policies and digital change? And within that, what kind of future uh, we should see of JustNet Coalition itself? So we have four panelists today. Uh, two of them are JN JustNet Coalition members. One is a new member, one is an old member, and two others are friends of JustNet Coalition with whom we have partnered. Therefore, from a diverse ecology, we would like to hear uh, what is the future of digital justice networking and what kind of directions JustNet Coalition uh, can uh, or uh, should take. So our first speaker today is uh, Neth uh, Deno, who is a researcher and the co-executive director at ETC Group uh, and has extensive experience in development and policy work on issues in agriculture, agriculture biodiversity, biosafety, climate change and environmental governance in Southeast Asia. So uh, Neth, uh, over to you, please. Thank you, Parminder. You can you hear me? Uh, you have 10 minutes, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll try. 
to um, it be even quicker than 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 ten minutes, uh, knowing how packed the the whole agenda is for the next two hours. And for me, um, this time of the pandemic actually um, poses a lot of challenge and also um, offers a lot of opportunities for di digital justice networking. Um, us at ETC, like we've, we've just joined um, JustNet Coalition, and it's a network that we have always um, admired, um, largely because of the diversity of organizations that are there, diversity not just in terms of North and South, but the interest and involvement of the organizations that are in JustNet Coalition are just awesome. And so we're happy to be invited and be part of the of the network. I would like to start with that because like there is strength that exists within just net coalitions and that strength is in its diversity. Um, as I said, both um, in terms of regional um, distribution and also the interest and the, the breadth of, of topic that the members of just net coalition um, covers when it comes to the different angles of the whole um, um, fight for for um, digital digital justice. Um, am I um, clear? Because um, I think someone chatted that there's no audio. No, uh, Nat, you, you are you very, very clear. You're very clear. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Sorry. And and for me, like um, the future, um, the future of, of digital justice networking is actually what um, the ju the JustNet coalition represents. Um, like going diverse and also expanding and going deeper into um, connecting with, with grassroots movement and social movement is key um, to the future of, of, of um, digital justice um, networking. Like I say, this coming from an organization that actually works a lot and deeply with um, social movements that are deeply working on food um, systems, um, particularly fighting for food sovereignty. Uh, we are in an era where big tech, um, the, the, the big technology platforms have actually gone beyond um, their um, conventional sphere and are slowly encroaching on other spheres such as food systems. We see this um, in, our, in our research where you have um, entities like Amazon, for example, becoming one of the top 10 um, retailers of food. Of course, included in that pack are JD.com, Alibaba um, in China. And also you see um, entities like Facebook and Google even investing on platforms that would sell um, food, that would actually um, have impact on, on the food system. And we see that the, the only way to go for movements um, around digital justice is to link arms with existing social movements and grassroots movements that are fighting for food sovereignty, uh, for example, in the food systems um, um, sphere. Also those fighting for climate justice um, in the climate change um, sphere and those who are fighting for rights and um, community empowerment in the area of, of, of the environment. And there's so much um, there that um, could actually um, be harnessed um, to strengthen and fortify the digital justice movement. Um, first, of course, to inform um, the social movement activists um, and also um, grassroots movements in the food systems um, would really welcome um, those information that um, digital justice activists have actually gained over the years um, um, in terms of of the, 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 the issues and also the sphere of power um, in the digital justice space that are um, impacting, slowly impacting um, spaces like food and agriculture, environment and, and climate. And there are actually um, a number of ways that, um, that groups that exist within um, JNC um, can do. Like I could um, see that like in the list, for example, you have groups that have massive um, links with um, social movements and grassroots movements such as FOCUS, um, Third World Network, and also like us um, in ETC and many others um, in the JNC um, circle who actually have existing partnership and collaboration with um, food systems activists who should be brought into this discussion, who should really um, be made aware 
of the of the of the um, potentials, um, the 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 com trends and developments that um, in the in the digital um, um, issues um, uh, in digital issues that are um, impacting on the food systems, um, climate, and also um, the environment. Also, there are uh, various ways where social movements can be linked into the digital justice um, activism by um, involving involving sorry i got lost sorry yeah can you hear me now yes Matt. Yes. yes okay yes, we can hear you yes sorry Yes, and um, there are um, various ways where this can be done. Um, like, like the other week, I was actually um, in a meeting with some organic agriculture producers here in Davao who are actually um, tackling um, the kind of issues that that um, that digital justice activists um, are have been tackling for for years, and it's really a welcome um, welcome um, well, welcome collaboration uh, for um, the organic agriculture movement um, at the local level to, to, to know um, the issues and also um, to get connected um, to digital activists and of course um, there are challenges to do this like social movements who may who may be in areas where uh, where we could actually barely um, have meeting with them because of the the um, the lockdowns and also the 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 restrictions in movements um, in, in areas like um, here in Davao, for example. But um, there are also um, ways that they are, they are um, evolving to be able to reach out to, to um, um, organic agriculture activists that are um, in areas that are um, not reachable by um, by Zoom, for example, like I we were just discussing how um, local NGOs could actually um, develop hubs um, in in town centers that have access to um, to um, digital um, connectivity and could actually serve as mini hubs for um, social movement representatives for grassroots um, organization representatives to be part of conversations that are happening um, in in these times when and it's actually um, um, it actually challenges um, our creativity as well. Um, to be able to take advantage of the existing um, networks that we have um, down to the local level, um, to be able to link those um, local movements to um, ongoing discussions and also advocacies and campaigns at, at the global level. So I think while the, the pandemic actually provides, um, presents some challenges and obstacles to broadening um, and widening our um, networking, the digital justice um, networking, it also opens up um, possibilities and opportunities to um, be more creative um, and also to create um, spaces for local groups um, to be connected to um, these kinds of conversations that would normally just involve um, digital activists that are mainly um, in, in, in cities and, and, and um, centers of, of information. So I would really um, challenge um, JNC um, and the whole digital justice movement to link arms with social movements um, in other um, thematic spaces such as food systems, environment, and climate, um, to be able to bring this breadth of information experiences that the movement has accumulated over the years and bring that into the discussions that matters to um, the guts of people who produce food, um, um, for example, um, and um, maybe um, gather more um, formidable forces and build um, a stronger movement that links um, across themes and also um, across levels um, globally. So I end my um, intervention there. Thank you, Net. Uh, thank you. And the Just Net Coalition greatly looks uh, to work closely with the ETC group, which has, as most of you would know, a great history of working in the technology and agriculture and climate justice area. And as you were saying that we need to work together and that would also evolve a new vocabulary in the digital uh, space, because we know that vocabulary is important uh, to make uh, social and uh, economic gains. And we are still in a formative period where these influences 
uh, can okay. still be exercised. Parliament, now I move to you. the. We lost you for a bit. Uh, okay. Now uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So now I go to the next second speaker, Deborah James, uh, who's the director of international programs at the Center for Economic and Policy Research and coordinates the global Our Work is Not for Sale, of which many of us are members, uh, the network. Uh, she has over 20 years of expertise working on issues of trade and democratic global governance. Over to you, Deborah. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much uh, to IT for Change for organizing this um, event and the JustNet Coalition, uh, which I've been very happy to be a part of uh, these last few years. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how um, the COVID-19 crisis that we're living through exposes, but has also been exacerbated by big tech's iron grip on our economic and social lives. Um, and then how basically all of the issues that I'll talk about that we're all sort of living through, which is a quick summary of them, uh, require more active uh, public policy making and um, you know, more action uh, from our governments and that these uh, actions would actually be really constrained by the proposed rules that big tech is trying to get through uh, in the trade uh, sphere. And so, you know, the problem obviously is that, um, you know, while there's a lot of sort of consternation nowadays about like, oh, there's problems with big tech running so many different aspects of our lives, they're trying to sort of do an end run around the democratic policy making that we should be having, even though we're not in most cases, um, because trade is actually the least democratic policy making sphere. And so they're just using that. Uh, it's not really about trade. Uh, it's really about undermining all the things that we're trying to do um, to rein in the power of big tech and reestablish the primacy of humans over technology. Um, and so the first thing to understand then is that, you know, in these trade rules, um, they're really trying to, like the basic concept is that they give rights to trade and those rights are exercised by corporations because that's who does the trading. Um, and they don't put any limits on those same corporations. So there's no new human rights or labor or any type of uh, obligation like that. No types of responsibilities, but just rights. And then for governments, they actually put limits or disciplines on the ability of governments to regulate. So all the responsibilities go on to governments and to shrink their ability to regulate and all of the new rights go on to corporations. Um, and of course we know that they are doing this um, through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which includes these rules through RCEP, uh, if any of your countries are part of the uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership in mostly Asia, uh, through NAFTA, through the WTO, which is where we mostly fight it. Um, so just a couple of things that I think we're all sort of living through right now. Um, obviously, there, there's been an increased understanding, I think, during the crisis on the over-dependence on global supply chains, and that this reduced Uh, the ability of many states to respond to the pandemic so that there is actually a need for more flexibility from existing trade rules, harmful trade rules, and there's been more calls for a fundamental rethink um, of the WTO and its extreme model of liberalization than at any time in its existence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these same corporations and many states are using the crisis to call for the expansion <clears throat> of these digital rules and the continuation of business as usual in the WTO, which is unfortunate. Uh, we're all familiar with the fact that economic inequality has exploded under the crisis. I think it's just one of the underlying things that we're all dealing with. Um, the assets of the world's richest men, almost all of them owners of big tech stock have metastasized by the tens of billions, while tens of millions of workers are filing for unemployment, actually probably a billion that we think about the worldwide. Um, in the United States, the downturn is hurting Black and Latino workers the most. Um, I'm sure in all of our countries, it's probably, you know, the least uh, integrated, the least, uh, the most marginalized that are being hurt. But this dependence on essential workers during the crisis has also led to more sort of widespread agreement that uh, so-called gig workers, um, Uber drivers, Grubhub, Instacart, you know, anybody who's uh, connected with these Uh, big tech behemoth, that they actually should enjoy basic labor rights. They need unemployment. They need to be integrated uh, into the social safety net. They need hazard pay, social protections, et cetera. Um, there's also been an, uh, an even bigger call, an accelerating call uh, under the crisis to tax uh, the digital behemoths um, as they're displacing an increasing um, percentage of business revenue 
in diverse sectors while actually deepening their de dependence on the public infrastructure. And even Europe and its recovery plan has a call to tax the digital behemoths. I think more people um, during this crisis are expressing uncertainties about artificial intelligence facial recognition because of the racist impacts. Um, that's come up a lot in the summer in the US uh, and I'm sure around the world. Uh, there's also just the problem related to COVID that there's more inaccurate information circulating on social media. Some tech companies are beginning to take steps to more aggressively control the content. Uh, but um, this is becoming a growing problem with the sort of uh, spreading the disease really. And we know that Trump is the biggest uh, super spreader. Um, there's growing concerns around privacy implications of the surveillance apps uh, regarding uh, contract tracing. Uh, but there's also, um, you know, more concern, I think, as online commerce boomed, there's actually more concern about the control that big tech has over our lives um, through the anti-competitive behavior. And there are really accelerating calls this year to break up um, multi-tentacled mega corporations like Amazon and Facebook and Google. Uh, and I think this is an area that is, is sort of newer. Um, we've been seeing it emerge over the last couple of years, but this year um, was certainly the year in the US that it sort of broke out in the open. I can tell you four books that were just published on it. We just had the House Antitrust Committee subcommittee that published a, a mammoth uh, report about the, um, the anti-competitive behavior um, of the tech behemoths. And we have a case now, uh, in case you didn't know, um, the Trump administration actually filed an antitrust case against Google, um, joined by many Republican attorneys general. So this will likely accelerate under the Biden administration. And you're going to see potentially next year or the year after actual moves by agencies to start to unwind some of the, the roll-ups um, that we see with these companies owning uh, uh, so many different sectors. So for each one of these situations, there's a sort of growing concern, I think, about the power of tech in our in our lives. Um, and, you know, if we look at the inequality, stripping the rights of workers, interference in elections, um, operation of social media as a sector spreading disease and misinformation, recruiting violence, which has also come up quite a bit, privacy concerns, not just home care and factory low income workers, but also white collar workers. So, it, you know, gets in the media more. All of these are obviously indicative of the problem of too much corporate power, and we're actually seeing a reaction. And that's very different, I think, than, um, than five years ago, but even considerably different than two years ago. And obviously the counterpoints to this you know, excessive corporate power is the increasing desire to tax, but the emerging call to break up these corporations as well, and then to regulate them as, as more like the unwinding of Section 230, which is the US communication law that gives platforms um, blanket immunity. So I think we need to make these connections. And I think in each of our areas, um, we can show uh, each of the areas that we all work in, because I'm sure that all of you work in some aspect of, of the things <laughs> that I'm just sort of summarizing. Um, I think we can show how, um, how the goals of you know, having labor rights apply also to workers in the gig economy um, would be undermined by the proposed rules that they're talking about in the trade sphere. I think we can show how you know, making sure that our civil rights apply, civil rights of not being discriminated against um, in our jobs, in our homes, in you know, our loan applications, in finance, in insurance, um, how this should apply, obviously, in the online world. This would also be undermined by provisions in digital trade that would ban disclosure, they wanna ban the disclosure or transfer of source code or algorithms, which is what operates all of these systems. Um, so, so that any kind of anti-discrimination remedy would be impossible. Um, obviously privacy rights around the world would be completely undermined um, by the rules which, um, which uh, allow the cross-border transfer of data and actually consecrate the tra cross-border transfer of data as a right of the corporations. Um, the need for platforms to be responsible for what's circulating online is, is really important. It you know, goes to the violence that being fomented, it goes to uh, the electoral mayhem that we're seeing in so many countries, the right turn, uh, the way that, that um, especially the right has really intervened in, in elections in such a nefarious way. Um, this, this is facilitated by the US law that says that the platforms can't be held responsible um, and that they are now the arbiters of, of free speech and online discussion. And that, you know, really does need to be changed. Um, and so, you know, that is one of the things that we're trying to export from the US through the digital trade rules is to say that platforms can't be held responsible. Um, 
you know, the need for antitrust laws to apply to the new business models, they're not, and we need new antitrust laws that actually make sense for the new business models. Um, these need to be developed. That won't be possible under the rules uh, because the prohibitions on the disclosure or, or transfer of source code. And the underlying issue that giving these corporations property rights to data as the collectors of the data, erasing all the claims, present and future, that producers or communities or workers would have to their own data. So I guess in, in closing, I would just say, you know, we need to, you know, we're always, we're talking so much about expanding our human rights, civil rights, economic, social rights into the online world, making sure that they apply. But if we really allow, I would say big tech to make an end run around our, you know, given weak corporate dominated democracies right now and consolidate new rights for them, every one of the solutions, the remedies that we're working on in all these different spheres will become nearly impossible. And so I think, you know, as we need to make more connections with people working on all these issues, on the labor issues um, of, of gig workers, on um, the privacy issues, on the, the anti-competition, uh, the antitrust issues, the pro-competition issues, that's a big new community that we can be working with um, to show those connections and then to say, hey, you know, you're, you're working on this, this remedy for big tech consolidation. It's going to be undermined by the global rules that they're doing under trade so that they're hiding it from you and we need to join forces uh, and work together. So I would say, I would definitely suggest, um, I think Parman Dehart asked for su concrete suggestions for JNC structure um, for a working group to focus on this, to keep the governments from agreeing to it. In case people don't know, they've announced that they're gonna have draft consolidated rules by the end of this year. They've been negotiating this whole time. And so we need to stop that and we need to stop more developing country governments from joining and we need to make sure that the EU and US are fighting over things and that they can't ever come to an agreement. Uh, but we need to be broadening and deepening our coalition efforts to do that. And I look forward very much to doing that together with all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Debra. Uh, as Debra described that the trade trade governance has become the default place to govern the digital. And we have been working with the network which uh, Debra coordinates. Our world is not for a sale for the last few years. The JustNet, member, the JustNet coalition members have been working with uh, that coalition to look at how we can stop framing of neoliberal rules for, the, uh, for a digital future at these uh, trade governance platforms. But we also have felt both the trade activists and those in the digital space, that this is not enough to just stop their agenda making, but those people ask for what is the alternative. It's not just that the, uh, the Northern groups are using trade governance as a place for making the agenda, but even, even developing countries think that somehow the WTO would give them uh, ways to do digital industrialization. And it actually has now happening that ambassadors at WTO who are carrier diplomats normally are asking their governments to develop a digital industrialization strategy rather than it happening the other way around that, you know, the digital industrialization strategy is made domestically first and your trade negotiators are working on the top of it. And therefore we have felt this, uh, this challenge. And this is one of the challenges which emerged in an area where both trade activists were not working and the digital activists were not working to start giving the first notions of what a digital industrialization strategy would look like. Now that's a very specialized area of industrialization uh, strategies, but we have had to start working with them. And this is a very good instance of how we have to work in spaces between the known sectors and disciplines of, uh, of social uh, work. Uh, I, I'd move now to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, Nandini from uh, IT for Change. Nandini uh, at IT for Change works on big tech regulation, platform workers' rights, and feminist political economy analysis of digital trade. Uh, over to you, Nandini. Uh, thank you, uh, Param. So my input is titled uh, New Horizons for Global Networking for Digital Justice. And uh, these reflections are drawn from my 10 years of experience of being a part of the digital rights constituency through my work at IT for Change, a location that has also given me the privilege of closely observing and participating in the work of the JustNet Coalition over the years. 
For digital rights advocacy from the standpoint of social and development justice, I think the landscape today is undoubtedly very different from 2014 when the JustNet coalition was born. The Californian ideology, that unique mixture of anti-statism and techno-utopianism, which used to be the unquestioned dogma in digital policy circles, it seems to be losing ground even in its very birthplace, and instead it's being replaced by calls for big tech regulation. One good thing is that the illusion that all is hunky-dory with the multi-stakeholder model of digital governance can no longer be maintained. The growing spheres of influence of US and China have torn asunder the fiction of the global internet. Surveillance capitalism and data colonialism have become part of the discursive common sense, even part of a mainstream Netflix documentary today. And we no longer need to struggle to convince people that the digital is not just about the internet, but it's about everything and it shapes the global socioeconomic order we inhabit, just like the conversations we have been having so far are also proving. So in this context, to return to the question that was placed before the panel, what needs to be done to push the bar on digital justice advocacy? What are the new horizons we need to aim for? I think that we need to focus on three ongoing debates in the area of digital governance, debates that are already happening at multiple levels and in fragmented ways, where we need to push the bar to bring new agendas. Area number one is the debate on curbing big tech power. Area number two is the ongoing debate on using human rights as a starting point for data and AI governance. And area number three is the debate that's happening on data sovereignty. So coming to area number one, in the ongoing debate on curbing big tech power, I think we need to move beyond recovering the free and fair economic marketplace to challenging the de facto privatization of core governance functions across the economy and society. We currently have a very active mainstream policy debate on curbing the unbridled data power of big tech. Unfortunately, the conversation rarely moves beyond economic liberalism. Whether it be calls to break up big tech or to introduce competition law proposals to contain the data wild west, we again and again come back to the idea of breaking monopolies and using a free and fair level playing field for economic innovation. The pervasive infrastructuralization of internet data and platform technologies has resulted in a default socialization of corporate rule setting across all aspects of life. And this I think is a bigger problem that we should not miss right now. The essential infrastructures such as payment, identification, and banking, and credit, they are being governed exclusively through the protocol power of private digital corporations and only towards their profit-making objectives. For example, recent research studies on M-PESA have revealed how the mobile money and microcredit platform's protocol power completely eviscerates the public service imperatives of banking systems, leaving behind only a market logic for governing crucial sectors like digital money and finance. As our lives become increasingly wrapped up in the embedded infosphere, the social is being increasingly subsumed into the market economy. Capitalist platforms' market logics govern the social, and these platform architectures become the new policy architectures. Feminists, in the context of social media governance debates, have long been cautioning us about the problems of platform protocol power becoming the new governance norm of the digitally mediated public sphere. And unless we change course, we will soon see this naturalization of private governance all across the social. The need of the hour is the new social contract for data economy and society that moves beyond economic liberalism. Now coming to my second point, the second agenda is that in the ongoing discussions around governance principles for the data and AI paradigm, we need to move beyond a human rights-based constitutionalism. As a recent review by Berkman Claims Center demonstrated, the data and AI governance debate is awash with calls for extending a human rights-based constitutionalism to this domain. But what is worrisome is that there is insufficient attention to the traditional limitations of the global human rights framework, especially on how it has subordinated equality and justice considerations to market imperatives. For example, take the case of privacy. Privacy in the digital age is not today an a priori freedom. It is always to be balanced in relation to the interests of the digital economy. Personal data processing guidelines in the GDPR and in other laws inspired by it assume that private persons in all their interactions are guided by the market logic of economic rationality. In trade policy agreements too, 
the stances that the eu has taken reveals that data rights as human rights are always being subordinated to the logic of economic efficiency of trans border data flows this leads to a situation where the human rights framework is only able to respond in a limited way to the question of how to protect rights in relation to data and ai development providing only a bare respite for individual rights however even when personal data is seen as political political rights must always be subordinated or tamed in relation to economic efficiency this is how the world seems to be working also there's the carefully constructed blind spot through which the geopolitical and geoeconomic dimensions of non personal data governance remain unaddressed what we need is a new constitutionalism for the data and ai paradigm which adequately recognizes the social relations embedded in data not just as personal footprints but also as the implications of data govern also as social relations embedded in data and their implications of these data governance choices for distributive and development justice now i come to the final point the third point is that when we are countering data colonialism we need to be able to sufficiently expand the imaginary of a people centered data sovereignty that makes a break with narrow calls for data nationalism against the onslaught of neo colonialist trade policy agreements calling for free and unrestricted cross border data flows understandably the immediate task that we often find ourselves called to take upon is to preserve the policy space for developing countries to determine their own development pathways in the data economy but when battling for a progressive vision i think that it is also important for us to distinguish our people centered visions of data sovereignty from the narrow calls of data nationalism that governments make the data economy cannot really progress in a people centered way if we just replace amazon for instance with a domestic monopoly like reliance jio in india that is equally impervious to labor rights local sustainability and ethical data practices and this also does not mean we must swing to the other extreme of a luddite data rejection trying to claim a nostalgic internet before its data heydays instead we should actually try to search for alternative collectivist models that are grounded in a people centered vision of data sovereignty trying to carve out alternative uh, data trusts data cooperatives etc in different sectors this may seem a very idealistic project but we need to start setting the discourse so we are not just carried along you know with the tide like jet storm this means answering hard questions such as how do we define data communities and how do we ensure representative data uh, decision making in such models decision making about data governance choices i mean so to recap i think that there are three things we need to immediately work on one we need to shift the debate on big tech regulation from free and fair markets to recovering the essential infrastructures of the social from privatized rule setting two we need to ensure that in benchmarking data and ai governance we are not reproducing the limitations of liberal human rights constitutionalism and instead that we are able to recognize the social value of freedoms and create a global constitutionalism for international distributive justice for data governance and finally in the debate on data sovereignty we need to move beyond data nationalism to recovering a people centered data economy thank you uh thank you uh, thank you nandini uh, nandini as uh, somebody from uh, a digital activism background uh, gave the view from within digital activism what it looks like uh, to move towards a more socially just uh, world uh, in terms of uh, digital changes and i'll ask her what would her expectations therefore would be from different progressive actors uh, in different sectors in terms of uh, achieving that aim uh, and what her uh, challenges are uh, meanwhile we move uh, to our last speaker today sofia skasera sorry sofia for uh, not pronouncing it well uh, sofia is an economist researcher and teacher at the julio godio world of work institute of the national university of tres de febrero in argentina she works as an advisor on economic and international trade issues at the argentine federation of trade and services employees and also with uni americas uh, sofia over to you please 
Okay, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me for uh, for uh, open up this space of the Justice Net Coalition and IT for Change of putting all this work together. It's really important for us. So the message I want to deliver is that the digital economy brought changes in the forms of communication. It changed the way we relate to each other, inform ourselves, ourselves participate, live, and solve problems. But above all, it changed the way we produce and therefore the way we work. These new forms have been used to make employment more precarious. The reality is that the world of work is not sick with robotics and technology, but with labor fraud. The introduction of technology is dying behind the backs of the workers without consulting them or respecting the adaptation process. The worker is not taken care of. In fact, they are being spied on. New technologies are used to atomize, separate, and control us. Never has inequality been so great in the history of humanity. We have never seen so much inequality. Never have we experienced so much poverty in some places while there is so much abundance and wealth in others. In this sense, inequality challenges us in the digital economy. Above all, because as Deborah said, it is in this sector where the greatest profits have been generated and where more than ever, these technologies are applied to make jobs more precarious. The maximum exponent of this is the platform economy. In most parts of the world, workers have not even managed to organize and fight for rights. They are in life-threatening working conditions. They have no right to health care, retirement, or minimum wage. And COVID-19 exposed them to being in the front line, romanticizing the quarantine through thousands of workers who globally guarantee the delivery of products so we can stay in our homes. In this context, Latin America is going through a deep political, social, and economic crisis. Debt crisis in Argentina, a recent coup d'etat in Bolivia with elections that fill us with hope, a constitutional reform in Chile with a citizenry that is awakening against neoliberalism. Brazil with a model that has removed security, organization, and control from the citizenry and has prioritized those who have the most. A convulsed region with a fragmented Mercosur that cannot find its way. In this context, the digital agenda seems to be the thing of the future. It seems distant and difficult to reach. The problems are urgent, the working class struggles and the companies meanwhile continue with digital, ex digital extractive industries and with the development of unicorn companies that grow without stopping but leave no benefits to society. They don't even pay taxes. In this sense, new answers are needed. Starting to dream a possible digital horizon for the region is one. One cannot plan what one does not dream. And the debate around what we want and can build is not even present in Latin America. We need documents and research that will lead us to think about possible horizons and that, mes and that message will spread through the academic and political spheres. At the same time, technology has separated us, but it can also bring us together. Unions need to understand these new tools and use them to their advantage. Cyber activism, network presence, and new forms of communications are vital spaces for social movements in general and for the labor movement in particular. Cross-border alliance channeled through global unions and from them with civil society organizations are powerful for strengthening social strategies that consolidate new labor rights. More resources, more alliance, and more strategies are needed for global unions in the region. It is necessary to work with these unions, conducting workshops and documents that put the digital agenda as a priority, despite the urgent problems that afflict the institutions. Urgency gets in the way of importance, and this reality goes beyond the union agenda, which does not find its way in many countries in the region. Meanwhile, agreements continue to be signed that limit the power and sovereignty of states to shape the digital economy to best advantage for their countries. The mobilization of civil society organizations demanding a non-signing of agreements at the WTO and various free trade agreements that has been total. In order to achieve this, it is necessary to continue working on putting this agenda as a priority in the demands. 
It is fundamental to advance a new agenda for workers' data protection, which limits what companies can do with the data they have on those working in their institutions. Data continues to be taken to feed algorithmic systems that will replace, warn, and control workers. The dehumanization of the economy is a reality, where the worker is required to be a perfect machine and work as if he or she has no right to be human. We cannot allow this. And in that sense, social movements need to understand the importance of data as a raw material of the digital economy and what kind of regulation needs to be built in their countries. Companies through algorithmic systems are prescribing reality the same way that national laws and regulations do. The only difference is that these algorithm, algorithms are written by companies without democratic participation. They do not inform the population about the imposed norms and they do not allow to modify them. A true technological tyranny imposed from the north to the global south. It is necessary to start drafting laws in the region that can be raised to the parliament and that are adjusted to the needs of each country in terms of data protection of workers and citizens, as well as allowing to audit of algorithms if necessary. All these actions are necessary and urgent in the region, above all because there is a state of drowsiness that is act gradually waking up. And we must be prepared with a new digital agenda for when the political situation allows us to promote other issues. The Justice Net Coalition is key in this regard. The internet and the problem of the digital world are at the times incomprehensible. We are afraid to think of technical problems that are difficult to solve. The truth is that while there are some issues that require technical assistance, the internet is a dispute space like any other. And in that sense, social organizations can cooperate in the debate. The Justice Net Coalition can provide the technical resources to support the debate and know how to change this digital work. Latin America what, uh, got up and came out of the shadows many times. Hopefully the next time, which can, we can see it coming, it would, feel, it would find us prepared and unite working for a new digital agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sophia. Uh, we have been, i for Change and the Just Net Coalition have been working with Sophia, with UNI, uh, and other trade groups, which uh, trade unions, which Sophia works with on workers' rights. The workers' rights in the industrial era were dependent on negotiating around ownership over the industrial modes of production. And now what does it mean in a digital era when AI and data have become key means of production? So how does ownership of data or ownership of AI uh, convert into new struggles. So we have been working uh, with uh, Sophia in Latin America and at the global level. And uh, I'm happy that we have made some progress in terms of worker rights uh, around data and we'd be working more in this area. Now we have come to the end of the panel and uh, about the questions, there was one question which has already been answered by Debra. This was the question around how realistic have our new proposals of regulating Google's and Facebook's of this world, including efforts at breakup of this uh, big tech platforms. This has started in US and in Europe. So the Debra has answered it in the Q&A uh, window. If uh, any of the panelists have a response to it. And there's another question uh, which I saw, but I'm not able to see it now. I think it's gone to the answered uh, window, uh, which is uh, that, uh, what is the view of the panelists on digital sanctions, which are now increasingly being imposed over other countries uh, and this uh, new geopolitics and what does it mean for the digital field? Uh, and a third question is for Nandini. And Nandini, how do you view? the ethics framework for AI slash trustworthy AI regulatory agenda of the European Parliament and Commission. Is this a good start towards a more human rights centered policies 
or is it a distraction of ethics washing? Uh, so this question is to Nandini, but we can go in the same order as uh, speakers uh, intervened. Uh, we can go, first go to Net uh, and uh, then to Debra and Nandini and Sophia, please. So if any one of you wants to engage with these questions. Uh, Net, do you have uh, anything to say on these questions or Debra can uh, take up? Net, are you here? <clears throat> Debra, can you hear me? I, I'm not able to get a response from Net. Yeah, Net is still muted. Oh, she's muted. Net, you are muted if you were trying to speak. Net? Okay, Debra, please go on and uh, I'll try to reach your uh, net. Okay, she's unmuted now. Let's go ahead and let her. Oh, uh, Net, please go ahead. Uh, net, I was asking whether uh, you have any response uh, to the two questions which have been posed. One is how realistic are new moves to break up big tech uh, being undertaken or being envisaged in the US and in the EU? And second was, what is your view about sanctions on digital technologies, which are increasingly being applied across the globe? Uh, and what does this geopolitics mean to the future of the digital? Uh, Debra, please go ahead. I think uh, okay. net is somehow unreachable. Okay. Um, so in terms of the, um, the issue about potentially breaking up big tech, I do think that there is um, some serious interest in it. Um, <clears throat> there, there's a lot of antipathy towards um, these companies, <gasps> corporations now um, in, um, in government. And I think that there has been a, a lot of really deep work with Congress to get them to understand the, the negative implications of these roll-ups and how damaging it is for our democracy. And you actually see it in a bipartisan way. It's very strange. Uh, but, you know, for Democrats, um, you know, they're concerned about the corporate power issues, they're concerned about electoral interference, they're concerned about um, the fact that there's been an explosion of, um, of actual uh, child uh, pornographic imagery um, online in, in the last couple of years and that these corporations are, are not being held liable. Um, and so I do think that they are going to do something to unwind them. It's going to be a really long process. It's not going to be easy. But the people who are going to be in the government... Um, are I think there the, it really depends on who Biden hires, uh, which is, but there's there's the first time ever there's a real effort to make sure that the corporations that are going to be regulated are not actually sitting in the seats of regulatory power and government. That's it's a bigger effort in the U.S. than has ever happened before. Um, and of course, if Trump wins, I mean, all bets are off. But the thing is that they have created this narrative that you know Republicans are discriminated against online. Um, even though Facebook's algorithms are very pro right wing. Um, and so they, they actually want to do something about it too. But I don't think they're going to be breaking them up. I just think that they're going to be, um, you know, doing something about Section 230. But I am hopeful. Is it going to be enough? No, we need, we need a, a burgeoning. You know, it's something that historically I don't think we paid enough attention to was the antitrust rules. But corporate monopoly power, the monopolization, the consolidation is just is just unprecedented and under COVID it's actually gotten way worse because these corporations are like buying up. They have tons of money and, uh, and they're, they're in a very cash rich position. They're buying up all these smaller companies that are going bankrupt. So it's, it's get actually getting way worse. And I do think that the U S government is, is going to start doing something about it. It's not going to be enough. We're going to have to push them, but that's the issue is that we as, as economic and social justice activists, I think need to pay more attention to this sphere than we used to and need to make the links with trade that they're undermining this effort um, through the trade talks. Uh, Net, can you hear us and can you speak now? Net, can you speak now? She says in the chat window that she's been trying to speak, but uh, there's a problem perhaps with her mic. So Nandini, do you want to take uh, the question or Sophia, uh, the same question which Debra answered, but also on the geopolitics of uh, sanctions vis-a-vis -vis digital technology and where it is leading us? Well, uh, what I what I can add is that um, I see that we are facing a, a, a two way model where we have the model of the technology that brings United States and the corporate the corporations, and the model that comes from China with the state leading 
the technology and state that it's surveillance that has surveillance over the population. But uh, the, the truth is that we cannot fall into that dichotomy of having either one technology governed by the corporations or one technology governed by the state. We need to build a new technology that is governed in a democratic way with a, 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 a tripartite approach, a way that we have civil society also participating in that. The sanctions could be good, and, and I, I don't want to talk about specifically that because it's US policy and I'm not really, I, I don't know really what institutionally is going on inside the US. I don't know the institutions of the US so much. I think it would be great if we have sanctions, but the truth is that the, the main problem is that these corporations do not pay taxes in the rest of the countries and that uh, they do not allow us to build our own technology with a different logic. And this is the biggest problem. And I see this in Latin America over and over again, because we are like the backyard of the United States. And so whenever you start building a new technology or you start doing something, well, they just come and buy the company or they just come and do a co competition that will ruin the companies in the, in, that are locally developing and stuff like this. So, so I think that the, the, the sanctions will be good to curtail the power of these companies, but the, the, the main problem here is it's about digital colonialism. It's about uh, trying to choose between a surveillance state with companies from China that are so strong and that are surveilled the, the, the population or companies from the United States who have the power to do whatever they want to in the region. And, and I think that's the main problem. The main problem is that they don't allow us to build our own technology. If we know something from the past is that technology sovereignty and technology express culture and express the way we connect and we communicate. We have seen this and this is, has been studied in philosophy for many, many years now. And we cannot, we are not allowed to build a technology that will, that will express our own communications, our own culture, our own systems, our own needs that will fulfill our own needs as a region, as an identity. And I think that's the biggest problem. So yes, sanctions will be great to curtail the power, but I think it's not enough. We need them to start paying taxes all over the countries that they are, um, they are um, managing and they are, uh, putting their products in, and we need them to stop doing digital colonialism, and we need a democratic approach for the internet and for technology. And I think that's that's the the main thing about about it. So that would be my conclusion. I totally would love to see that they have at least one sanction, and at least they curtail the power in some way but we need to keep going forward. We cannot rest in that because that is not enough for the global South. Uh, thank you, uh, Sophia. I think uh, the questioner, uh, Mokaberi Amir Hossein, meant sanctions in terms of countries putting digital sanctions on other countries. Like Trump has on a very ad hoc uh, basis been saying that uh, this country cannot export this thing to not only to the US, but any country which the US does business with. And that becomes kind of a rolling uh, sanctions against one side of a new digital Berlin wall and the other side. And increasingly we uh, see the whole world get split in terms of digital standards, digital platforms and so on and start a new uh, digital cold war. So how does uh, these sanctions work? And of course, uh, on some countries uh, with which US may not have good relationships, how they use digital sanctions uh, to curb the uh, economic opportunities, but also the human rights uh, of people of that country. So that, that was the question, but I'll come back and I'll go to uh, Nandini. Nandini, there were one question specific to you, uh, which is uh, Ansgar Koene has asked whether ethic frameworks for AI slash trustworthy AI of the European Parliament and Commission is a good start uh, towards a more human rights centered policies or it is just a distraction of ethics washing. 
And there is another question by Andred uh, Estrohusen, who is the chair of the IGF. Uh, welcome, Andred, and thanks for being here at our session. She says, since uh, Nandini, you spoke of a uh, data governance framework, uh, are there risks of attached to defining anonymous personal data as non-personal data, and whether this would allow companies to have a lesser burden of compliance uh, when using uh, this data? Uh, Nandini, and I'll try to go back then to Net. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I just, uh, uh, you know, I'll just, I'll try to respond to like uh, both uh, questions very quickly. So in terms of the first one, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that a human rights uh, or an ethics based framework uh, for AI governance by itself is not adequate. And uh, the reason I'm pointing this out is for the things that uh, Sophia has already discussed that if we need to have a, an approach where developing countries can have a technological pathway that is outside falling in either the US camp or the China camp or picking sites in this digital cold war, and they need autonomy, we need to have questions at the global level about how are these data flows going to be governed, what will be the resource management, the geopolitics and the geoeconomics. The problem really is that when these uh, ethics documents and all these AI and human rights frameworks by itself are just like endorsed by the EU as say uh, third approach. And earlier on, we have also seen this kind of approach implicit or uh, you know latent even in things like you know the Osaka Declaration and data flows with trust. It is the linkage between these two that I am very worried about and I find problematic. And yes, and that's the kind of washing I'm really worried about the uh, ethics washing. Uh, now, coming to the uh, second question, uh, yeah, I think that uh, when we talk about this question of governing anonymized uh, data, and we are looking at anon anonymized data as part of non-personal data governance resources, and you know the risks of like you know going in that way, I think largely the problem comes because there are many countries where the order of steps that we have to follow when enacting legislation for data has not been followed. For example, in India, it's a problem that we do not have a personal data protection law, but uh, without enacting it, we would also parallelly proceed on non-personal data governance conversations. So the fact that there must be personal data protection and then you discuss non-personal data governance within it, the sequencing is very important. And I get uh, these debates come up because governments don't always follow this uh, uh, sequencing. And I just had one more final point to add to this whole discussion on sanctions. I think that considering we have never ever really solved the internationalization of ICANN problem, there is a real problem when we are talking about trade sanctions actions. And you know, that is an issue we should not forget and we should keep like uh, coming back to. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nandini. Uh, on the question of non personal data, since I work in this area, uh, I think uh, the problem also is that currently anonymized personal data is in a lawless land. Moment anonymization takes place, it is beyond all laws because it is not defined, it is not categorized. All companies base their artificial intelligence on such data and therefore they're very free to do whatever. Now, once we start categorizing it, as a distinct category and develop frameworks around it, then at least some, some rules of non-personal data, anonymized data are laid out. Because in absence of categorization, you don't, can't govern. So the benefit of categorization is governance, though I completely understand the point, whether that allows them to do new things, which they were not able to do it as per the existing personal data. Uh, regulation. And I think this is a question for a wider discussion as well. Net, are you with us now? I think the, the problem with the net continues. Uh, 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 I wanted to ask each of you if you can come back just in terms of one demand. Three of you at least come from three different sectors. Uh, net comes from agriculture and climate change. Debra comes from uh, trade justice. Sophia comes from workers' rights. And Nandini comes from a digital uh, activism area. So the three sectoral people, can they say just in one line, what would you expect a GNC-like network to do for you better than what it's doing now? And from Nandini, from a digital uh, activism area, 
what would you want sectoral actors who are now becoming impacted quite much by digital phenomenon uh, should do more so very quickly we are running out of time so all four of you in one or two sentences please uh, start from the reverse uh, order uh, sofia first nandini debra and meth last sofia uh, as i mentioned in my speech i think that uh, the 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 things that from the the trade union movement there's not much awareness and there's not much knowledge about the digital world. Uh, they are so worried about urgent needs that are totally, uh, totally important and they need to, 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 to address more daily issues that they do not see the big picture of the digital economy and what's coming towards them. And, and how can they use these technologies to change their own strategies? Some unions do, see this, but many unions do not. And I think that um, JNC can help them uh, building these strategies and, and, and knowing and, and building a way forward, building what their claims should be uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the digital economy. Um, some issues are really technical and, and folks do not have the time nor the resources to think about these issues. So I think that um, the Justice Net Coalition can help trade unions build their point of view uh, to, to have a claim uh, for the digital economy. What do they want for the digital economy and what new strategies they need to build in order to use the internet in their favor. So I think, I think in that sense, they, if, if we can get to work in a coordinated way, if the Justice Net Coalition can help build this, uh, this capacity, uh, I think it would be good because you have broad experience and you have uh, professionals working in so many fields from the digital economy, as you mentioned. And so I think that's the biggest, the biggest um, asset that the JNC has. So, yeah. We cannot hear you, Parminder. Uh, Mokaberi, who asked the question about digital sanctions says that his question has not been answered because what is the role of JNC in dealing with these kind of digital sanctions? So very quickly, uh, Mukaberi, we have been on the forefront of internationalization of ICANN uh, to remove it from the US jurisdiction. Uh, we have been working with governments of India, Brazil, even with some European governments in this uh, regard. Uh, we are very much against uh, digital sanctions over countries because it comes in the way of their human rights and economic opportunities. We were at the ITU plenipotentiary where new regulations were being written and the, uh, the conference broke down because the members' right to be on the internet was challenged by some Western countries and we spoke and wrote against it. So I'm just putting up it up that the JustNet Coalition does work in this area and we can uh, talk more. You can please write to IT for Change and, uh, or JustNet Coalition Secretariat and we can answer your questions. Net, are you here? Uh, Debra, please go ahead. And meanwhile, I'm still trying to get net. Uh, Debra, just one minute. We are almost exceeded, and I have to just uh, speak for two minutes after this. Yeah, Debra. Uh, just in closing, um, thank you for doing this, uh, recognizing the leadership of uh, of IT for Change and JustNet Coalition, and pulling this together. I would be happy to follow up with anyone. You know, if you're in one of these areas that we talked about, where there's some incursion of trade rules into what you're working on, workers' rights antitrust, anything. Um, obviously, there's connections with agriculture. There's connections with so many things. I'd be happy to talk with you further. I'd be happy to, you know, we can do a webinar together on, you know, where you're talking about your issues and how digitalization is affecting that. And then we can talk about how, you know, the, the rules would actually make it worse and harder for you to get done the type of changes that you need um, in the governance uh, on the international level or on the national level to your sphere. Um, so I put my email there, please follow up, but I would love to see that facilitated more easily by JustNet Coalition in terms of knowing who's out there, who's doing that work, you know, the sort of mapping of who to talk to when you want to know, um, like I'm just meeting people more interested in antitrust here. 
Um, so that it's just, I think, that exciting networking space, and then we can use it to, uh, to create more connections. Uh, so thanks uh, very much. And especially around the issues that we didn't get to talk about of digital industrialization and data as a public good, because I think when you put those forward, you really see that the rules that they're talking about are the opposite of what we need to be doing. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Deborah. Net, are you there? Uh, no, I, I don't think she's there. So to close, uh, I would uh, uh, I would welcome here those people who are not members of JustNet Coalition here to write to us. Go to the JustNet Coalition website, find uh, the ID of the Secretariat, or go to the IT for Change website and write to us. And we are ready to talk to you. Even welcome you to the coalition, or otherwise address uh, your questions. Uh, I just want to tell all people here that we are trying to scale up JustNet Coalition to a next level. We are even calling it JustNet Coalition 2.0. Uh, we never had stable funding, but it seems that now we have at least a little funding for one full-time person uh, from the next year. And we also would be working on um, uh, working groups for each core area like climate justice, agriculture, and so on and also perhaps organizational nodes and regional nodes. So we are going to expand the JustNet Coalition work in a major way in coming years, and we'll be having uh, uh, meetings or Zoom meetings in the coming months to talk about it, and we'll welcome you all to those meetings. And I now move on to hand over to Anita Gurumurthy, who will take us to the next section of this meeting on the release of the Digital New Deal compendium. Anita, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Param. Welcome to everybody. This is part two of the Digital Justice Conversations organized by the JustNet Coalition and IT for Change. After that scintillating part one, we now have a rapid fire round. We are honored and proud to have with us the contributors of our Digital New Deal compendium and delighted to release its beta web version here at the UN IGF. A little bit about the context of the compendium. For all of us, 2020 has been strange. It has been surreal. The pandemic has accelerated the tendencies of uh, digital capitalism um, and its propensity to swallow up the resources of the planet and its people. And the latest statistics from uh, NASDAQ are quite shocking. It seems like the time for US big tech could not have been better, you know, Biden or Trump. The NASDAQ 100 index, a benchmark dominated by the US's leading tech companies is up 24% this year till September. By contrast, the MSCI all country world index, which is a measure of global stocks, excluding US shares is down nearly 8%. What is more, 45% of the market capitalization of the MSCI index belongs to big tech. So here we are staring at growing inequality with our agriculture and food systems, education, finance, healthcare, all going digital, no longer slowly, but rapidly and steadily. And as Amartya Sen points out in a recent article, the world is facing a pandemic of authoritarianism, a difficult place indeed. But we cannot resign ourselves to the current frames of the digital paradigm. A brand new future is certainly possible. This is what the Digital New Deal Compendium does. It brings together leading thinkers, activists, and practitioners from across the globe to provide a bold perspective that grapples with the idea of digital justice. The basis of a new deal we must claim, we will claim. On behalf of the JustNet Coalition and IT for Change, I invite you to explore and engage with our Digital New Deal essay series and interviews. We now hear from the authors directly. You have the link to the site, the microsite, on the chat box, as well as a slide deck for a quick preview. It's like an overview. We have a couple more essays that are coming in, and soon we will also have a PDF document that is downloadable. Over to Deepti Bhartur, who will guide us through the presentations from the Digital New Deal contributors. Over to you, Deepti. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, everyone, for joining us at the launch today. I have the privilege of in introducing our spectacular lineup of speakers who join us from around the world. Uh, they will be drawing from their published and upcoming contributions to the series and share with us short takeaways in a couple of minutes on their idea for the Digital New Deal. I encourage session attendees here 
and those who are on our um, IGF YouTube live link to follow along. Uh, my colleagues will be posting uh, essay links into the chat window, so please do check those out as well. And as Anita mentioned, there is a slide deck that we will be sharing as well. I request all our speakers to please keep their input to three minutes or less. And now, without further ado, because we have a lot to be done, I bring on our first speaker, uh, Gianluca Yaziolono from the Feroz Lalji Center for Africa at LSE. He represents himself and his co-authors, Marian Lima and Laura Mann today in sharing his views on a digital new deal against corporate hijack of the post-COVID-19 future. Over to you, Gianluca. Gianluca? I invite uh, Gianluca to please uh, join us at this point and maybe unmute his video and audio. We seem to be missing him in action. So I'm just gonna give it a second more. And um, All right, I think we'll just wait for him to join uh, back. So I'm just gonna move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have with us uh, Richard Kozel Wright, who is the Director of Globalization and Development Strategies Division at UNCTAD the United Nations Body on Trade and Development. I invite him to share from his interview on how the Global South can rise to the challenge of a digital new deal. Uh, Richard, please take over. Uh, Deepti, thank you uh, very much. And thank you to Anita and IT for change uh, for the invitation. I'm sorry, I can't really uh, stay and listen uh, in depth. I have, I have other meetings. Um, Look, we've essentially, over the course of the last three or four years, in the context of um, the Trade and Development Report, our annual flagship publication, have been thinking about what a global Green New Deal would look like. There's a lot of talk about new deals with a very national focus, but the challenges we're talking about, and that's climate, as well as the digital challenge, as well as uh, inequality, all of which have emerged out of this hyper-globalized world of footloose capital, uh, uh, corporate rent-seeking and, and neoliberal uh, ideology. Um, these, these are problems that can only be addressed at the international level. And we have a multilateral system that essentially is not fit for purpose for all kinds of reasons that I, I don't want to go into right now. But, but the multilateral system as we see it uh, is not capable of addressing these problems and in important respects has contributed to these problems. So what, we, you know, what we've been trying to do essentially is to provide an alternative narrative structured around a set of uh, different principles from those that inform uh, the neoliberal agenda, a very different set of policies that come out at the national level from the kind of austerity, liberalization, deregulation, <clears throat> deregulation model that has dominated uh, policy making in both the North and South for the last 30 years, and then a series of complementary reforms to the international architecture that, um, that we think are necessary if we're going to get the kind of uh, uh, alternative policy agenda and effective coordination at the international level. Obviously, the work that we do in UNCTAD is particularly focused on issues around uh, trade and finance, in, in, in the case of the work we do in particular around the case of finance. But, but the digital side of that story, for the reasons that Anita already mentioned, you know, which have, have been exposed and exaggerated by COVID-19, are kind of central to this unbalanced and highly unequal world. And, and I would be, it would not be true of us to say that we have systematically introduced the digital story into our work on a global Green New Deal. Although I think we have done some 
original work, particularly in the 2018 Trade and Development Report, about the way in which um, the, the nature of data is a factor of production and the way in which that has allowed very large and powerful uh, uh, international corporations to uh, dominate the, the digital space um, uh, is very much indicative, I think, of the larger challenges that we face uh, in, in, in finding alternatives. So, so the, the work that the interview that you kind of generously offered me in, in this compendium is very much an attempt to, in a very tentative way, I think, think through the way in which the digital side of this story um, uh, figures in the work that we've been doing on, on a global Green New Deal. And, and yeah, and to make the obvious point, I think that, that um, as with all past technologies, the digital technology is Janus faced. It looks both ways and it can go either way. It can reinforce uh, existing inequalities and inequities, or it can open up the space for, for new opportunities and new thinking and new directions. And ultimately that, you know, which way it goes is a political decision. And that's why at least we think, I mean, we, we in our small way contribute, I hope to, to, uh, to, to, to shifting the narrative, but you know, the, the efforts of IT for Change and other civil society organizations uh, in providing this counter and reinforcing this counter narrative is clearly incredibly important if we are going to actually um, uh, exploit these, these new, new, new technologies in a more democratic and inclusive manner. And, and I think the efforts that, I, that, we've, that we've been making in that direction uh, in the world of finance, for example, or with respect to corporate rent seeking more generally, I think very much complements uh, the efforts that, that IT for Change are doing. And, and, and we, of course, are very happy to participate in whatever way, way we can uh, with with uh, your efforts and initiatives. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. Um, I now call upon Francois Solard, uh, who coordinates the international networked communication platform, Dumia. Uh, he shares from his very point, poignant essay, a Westphalian turning point for the digital. Over to you, uh, Francois. <laughs> Um, thank you, Dipti, for your invitation and hi to everybody for this nice meeting. Um, I will try to share with you um, basically three ideas because the time is short. Um, my first one is to say that um, and to take back the idea of my contribution to IT for Change and for this call of, of papers that we are not actually in a Westphalian turning point. You know, the Westphalian moment, the Westphalian rearrangement of the world in 1748 was the moment where political leaders understood that the cost of destruction was too much important, too much heavy, and they decided to reorganize um, the international relations between states and between power at this time. And this international system, born at this time, has organized uh, centuries in our international scene. So I believe that despite of the huge effect of the COVID pandemic, I believe that um, the main strategical and geopolitical equilibriums are not really shift and modified by the situation. The COVID pandemic does not create a world after Many things have been, have been written about this issue, but they are not really a world after, but some shift and reorganization are, are, are going on. The relation between, between China and US is quite uh, the same than before. Some aspect have, has been deepened. Economic sanctions are continuing. Regional powers are raising. We can see it in, in, in Asia, for example, in Central Asia. And, and so, um, rather than a big shift, we can see a form of catalyzation and acceleration, as it has been said in the chat before, uh, in terms of economical decoupling, informatization. And uh, within this informatization, this computerization of the world, I prefer this term to digitalization, 
the phenomenon of predation. Um, this was my first my first point. No, so in fact there is no. I have, I want to stress that there is no structural crisis within capitalism, rather another accident. No. Okay, and this is my second point. Um, if there is no great recession, if there there is not great stagnation, there is maybe more deeply, and it's very difficult for us to get it visible, there is a great restructuring. That is a shift in terms of organization, psychological and social frameworks due to the computerization phenomenon, or if you want, digital phenomenon. And this great restructuring is visible in terms of impacts of symptoms and some initiatives, it's quite interesting, in the World Economic Forum, for example, maybe you, you've seen the idea of the great research initiatives. Some people, among them, Klaus Schwab, founder of the World Economic Forum, is putting on the table the idea of great research initiative, trying to reconfigure the settings of neoliberal paradig paradigm um, according to the new time uh, set it with uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, some social movements try to, like the World Social Forum, try to respond to this and to take uh, the initiatives. It's quite difficult because social initiatives don't have the same support than, than, than before, um, 15 years ago. We can see also very concrete um, phenomena like a shift to renewable energies as it has been said before the shares of it giants has raised um, more quickly to to tops which is are very uh, frightening in some ways and also another point very interesting is that uh, informatization has been included in almost every recovery plans at national levels so what's my, 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 my third, my, my final and, and third point? And I would take the sentence of Eric Bridgelson and Andrew McAfee. Um, they said, we have to come up with strategies that allow human workers to race ahead with machines instead of racing against them. I think it doesn't mean that we have to accept the new uh, natural order uh, pushed by the digital phenomenon, but I think we have to push forward a new horizon for an economy. That is to say, to recognize this great restructuring of social, political, and economic backgrounds, to shape an imaginary for especially for leaders and for uh, elites. And in fact, we have a big lack. Um, of this kind of uh, imaginary and the best the best demonstration for me is that we continue to turn the back to what happens uh, could i ask you to please wrap up uh, if it's possible because we're sort of running late thank you yeah uh, i am concluding and so um, we are turning back to um to this phenomenon and it's very difficult to, to recognize that we have, in fact, a new conceptual reference to approach this economy. This is a winner-take-all economy, a money, monopolistic competition. This new economy has fixed costs. It goes to a maximum risk uh, logic. It's, it has increasing returns to scale. Um, and these aspects are completely transforming the current economy, but we are still making a lecture, an analysis of uh, the current phenomenon with an old uh, way of understanding. So I, I, I hand here and thank you very much for this, uh, for this talk. Thank you so much, Francois. I bring back here IT for Change's very own Anita Gurumurthy, uh, who articulates along with, uh, I mean, on behalf of her co-author as well, Nandini Chami, um, also from IT for Change. Uh, she's speaking on feminist frames for a brave new digitality. I just want to emphasize to all our speakers to please 
uh, try and keep to the three minute time as much as possible. Over to you, Anita. Yes. So we all recognize the huge crisis at the digital turn. So what would our feminist foremothers want us to do? This is what Nandini and I, drawing on the conversations with our colleagues, have attempted in our essay. First thing is our foremothers would remind us that the age of Columbus is over. Conquest and colonization is just another name for genocide. The human-centric ways of the world have left a trail of devastation. Greed and extraction have seen the emergence of data and AI as structures of dominance, hard-coded for injustice. So our first task is to think, to rethink the theory of existence, how the nature culture technology bundle can be seen through a post-humanist structural justice lens. No privileges here for Columbus. Feminists from the global South who have thought long about citizenship would then say, okay, if we have our theory right and we know how to make sense of the world, how do we make sure it explains the claims of marginal persons? Do they, for instance, need data as much as data seems to need them? The emphatic answer is feminists need the digital, we need the data, but we need it for achieving precisely the opposite of what extractive intelligence capitalism needs it for. Our claims making must come from ideas of belonging and community an ecosystem approach. We see social power encoded in AI and we want to be sure everyone can see it too. Our claims are therefore rooted in an anti-patriarchal, anti-imperialist, post-individualist, decentralized network data, nature, culture, universe. Finally, feminism is not just a theoretical frame. It's also an epistemology of being and becoming. The third task therefore is about making room Feminist efforts to build community and forge publics are trapped in the dominant communicative arenas of the digital that instrumentalize and co-opt political subjectivity. We must therefore make room for less legible narratives in building our solidarities. To know more about sense-making, claims-making, and place-making, please read our essay. If you're not already feminist, now is the time. Thank you, Deepthi. Thanks so much, Anita. Uh, we haven't had uh, luck with uh, Jan Luca, who seems to have unfortunately had a connectivity issue. So I'm going to invite his co-author, Laura Mann, who's also here, to very briefly uh, make an input on his behalf. Uh, Laura, could you please take the stage, please? Yes, I will first of all want to thank uh, the network for organizing both. Uh, you guys are probably the only thing that makes optimistic in 2020 and it's always a pleasure to engage with you and others in your network. Um, so our paper in this uh, series is really trying to understand how the pandemic is this kind of moment of reckoning for capitalism in some ways or contemporary forms of capitalism in some ways in the sense that it's revealing some of the vulnerabilities of the economic model that's premised fundamentally on finding ways of kind of de-skilling the economy to kind of capture the efficiency and productivity gains. And so, you know, before digital technologies or part of the digital transformation of the global economy has been about breaking down work process and transferring them to new parts of the world, which has allowed in some cases, some low and middle income countries to capture some of those work opportunities. But as we see kind of automation increasing, um, you know, that kind, those kinds of opportunities are very fleeting and they're going to be reduced over time. So all over the world, we have this kind of phenomenon of the economy being de-skilled and the efficiency gains from that kind of restructuring of work being captured and not necessarily being invested in ways that would allow you know, job creation in future. So our paper kind of situates the pandemic within that longer process of economic restructuring. And the pandemic has really revealed the kind of social vulnerabilities of what happens when you do that to economic and social systems. But at the same time, the pandemic has also been this great moment of opportunity for tech firms to kind of consolidate their strength over the economy because they've been helpful in allowing governments to address the situation, helping people to shift and working online, 
helping out with the pandemic tracking itself, you know, doing track and tracing and using data to figure out how to control it. So they've actually had a very, very good crisis. So there's a kind of paradox at work in this moment that the economic model is making us vulnerable, but at the same time, the tech firms that are kind of helping this economic model are keeping the paradigm afloat, even as it reveals its vulnerabilities. Um, so our paper, the rest of our paper is trying to look at, you know, how will this kind of paradox or this kind of, um, you know, vulnerability hyperdrive be interpreted politically and publicly in different parts of the world. And we kind of identify three fault lines to understand it. So the first is kind of public reliance on tech firms and the technology that they have to make public services work. And that's variable in different parts of the world. And it's something that tech firms are very strategic about in trying to kind of build themselves into social services and into economic development plans. Um, the second one is the way in which tech firms are actively trying to shape, reshape the research agenda as the economy becomes more digitized, uh, economic information about the economy is becoming data and they have access to data they have access to our knowledge of what's happening in the economy so as that digitization goes you know we're going to have to rely on them for information about the economy and that puts them in a very strong position to shape research agendas in ways that are commercially beneficial for them and the third thing is the kind of co-option of civil society um, both in terms of kind of funding activities, but also in terms of some tech firms have the ability to, you know, actively manipulate uh, social information and pub political information in their favor. Can I ask you to wrap up? Sorry. Yes. So, the, so our paper is looking at sort of how these um, kinds of strategic ways in which tech firms are shaping uh, the conversation around their impacts are kind of variable in different parts of the world and how we might be able to kind of push back. So we talk about strengthening the regular regulatory capacity of the state, thinking about ways of finding more public money for research and also activating explicitly transnational civil society so that we don't become focused on solutions that are very good for citizens in one part of the world, but have grave implications for citizens elsewhere. So thank you very much. And I'm, I'm sorry if it was a bit uh, hastily uh, summarized, but if you're interested, definitely check out our paper and check out the other contributions to this wonderful series. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Next up, we have Anusuya Sen Gupta, who is co-director and co-founder of Who's Knowledge, uh, who joins us on behalf of herself and co-author Azar Kosovic uh, to share a couple of highlights from their joint essay, Whose Knowledge is Online, Practices of Epistemic Justice for a Digital New Deal. Uh, over to you, Anusuya. Thank you, Deepthi and IT for Change. Hello, everyone. I'm Anusia Sengupta. I'm from India, currently based in London. I'm co-founder and co-director of Who's Knowledge, a global multilingual campaign to center the knowledges of marginalized communities, the majority of the world, online. We are a feminist, anti-colonial, anti-racist collective. My brilliant co-author is Azar Kasovic from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Azar is a gender in process queer feminist activist. They are a community organizer and one of the core team members of LGBTIQ plus association Okbir and the Queer Archive, curating testimonies of queer activists in the Bosnian war. As Deepthi said, our essay is called Whose Knowledge is Online? Practices of Epistemic Justice for a Digital New Deal. We reimagine the internet from the entry point of content and knowledge online. Even though we know there's no one internet that we all experience, even though access is highly differentiated across geography and demography, we know that over 60% of the world is online, that over 75% of those online are from the global south, and over 45% of all women are online. Yet the internet does not look like as, it does not look like me. Our work therefore examines epistemic or knowledge justice online. As and I and our companieras in our organizations and across the world look to transform this reality of epistemic injustice of content that is primarily white, straight, male and global north in origin, primarily from Europe and North America. 
Epistemic justice, therefore, is a creative foundation for us, critical and creative foundation for us, for possible internet futures. In our essay, we lay out the context for our work, including, but not limited to, decolonizing Wikipedia and centering radical community archives. We suggest three organizing principles for this reimagination and redesign. First, center the margins and convene unusual and unlikely allies. At whose knowledge we've been convening and collaborating through our decolonizing the internet program. And we bring together community, community activists, scholars, technologists, archivists, librarians, open knowledge advocates, and many others to think through ways to transform our digital presence and futures. Secondly, contextualize, contextualize, contextualize. In creating the queer archive at Oakweed, we found that platforms for archive building, including open source, are rarely contextualized and localized in different languages. And we know this to be true for platforms across the internet. Thirdly, counter the global hegemony of Silicon Valley through a constellation of translocal imaginations and designs. We need to, for once and for all, break the myth of the global internet that is primarily designed and controlled from Silicon Valley. This homogenizing narrative is entrenched in digital infrastructures, content, and governance, as we point out throughout our essay. We need to break it. Those who have caused the inequities of the internet cannot imagine or lead the ways to create a decolonized, feminist, equitable internet or internets. Let us remember that we on the margins are the majority of the world. In our resistance is our reimagination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anasuya. Um, I now move on to Stefania Milan, uh, who is Associate Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, she will talk to us about her upcoming essay titled COVID-19 from the Land of Otherwise, uh, which she's undertaking with co-author Emiliano Trere from the Data Justice Lab. Over to you, Stefania. You hear me? Yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hope you don't hear someone making coffee in the background as well. But in these COVID times, uh, when we share our space, we have to go a little bit with the tide. So uh, it's a pleasure um, to be able to join this amazing crowd of people uh, really bringing forward cutting edge reflections on uh, um, data justice that is in, uh, you know, also intersects uh, our uh, daily life and the challenges of these very strange times. So what Emiliana and I are working on is a, a piece that is in fact uh, a condensed version and expanding version of something we already published uh, earlier this summer called the rise of the data poor, the pandemic, uh, the COVID pandemic, sorry, seen from uh, the margins. So um, as we are still working on our uh, final version for the compendium, uh, I'm going to share with you what we had so far, which is more or less reflection on the notion of data poverty. Where do we start from? So we started from observing that quantification and comparisons and numbers essentially are central to the narration of the COVID uh, pandemic. Numbers really determine the existence of the problem. They determine our perception, our ability to care, and but also our ability, for example, to contribute to relief effort. So if I suffer from the effects from the, uh, of the pandemic, if I am counting this in number, I might become visible and I might be helped. If not, uh, I am in a condition of vis visibility that determined maybe you know, also uh, my death. Now, um, states themselves uh, you know, an international organization, do we use these numbers uh, to uh, determine where to put, uh, for example, public money, if uh, any, or you know, how to distribute uh, welfare uh, support, or soon also, assuming they become available, uh, vaccines. However, these numbers are essentially uh, very acritically, uncritically used and presented, so we are communicating the numbers, but we don't really know where the numbers come from, right? And um, this uncritical approach uh, makes so that, uh, you know, the seductive power of numbers still comes to us, still get to us and determines our behavior, state behavior and so on and so forth. But uh, also hides 
certain conditions of invisibility. This invisibility has to do with what we call data poverty. So data poverty essentially concerns the uh, situation of those, especially communities, individuals at the margins of the neoliberal system that do not show up in the margins. Now, what, sorry, in the, in the county uh, related to the COVID uh, pandemic. I'm not going to ask you to please wrap up. Thanks. Sure. So data poverty is, goes beyond the notion of, for example, data colonialism. I mean, data colonialism subsumes that there is a, um, a relation of exploitation between big companies and, uh, and us as, as uh, individuals. That still holds true, of course, but the notion of data poverty uh, really has to do with, uh, the, it's a condition of existence in the data fight society. So being COVID, the first pandemic of the data fight society, we ought to give this increasing data uh, poverty serious uh, consideration as it really might affect the possibility of people to uh, survive. Thank you very much. And I put uh, a link, uh, as I said, to an old piece um, that speaks about this in the chat in case you're interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania. I move on to Net Danu, whom some of you had the opportunity to listen earlier. Net represents the ETC group and she is here to share with us insights from the essay, Food for All or Feeding the Data Colossus, The Future of Food in a Digital World. Uh, Neth, please uh, take the stage. Thanks, Dipti. I hope this works this time. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, I'll take advantage of that. Um, as you mentioned, our essay is actually a collective essay of ETC group, largely from our program staff, um, who are based in Mexico City, in London, in Canada, and me um, here in Southern Philippines. Our data, our, our um, essay actually will discuss how mega corporations have identified food and agriculture systems as sources of data and proceeded to harvest the data for financial gains, profit. We also identified some of the most dangerous features of this data colossus. And we propose strategies and components of an alternative new deal for food and agriculture based on democratic processes of technology assessment and the principles of food sovereignty. As a snapshot, uh, we discussed in the essay how the food system have all, has always been a battleground for the deployment of new technologies and how technologies have transformed the global food system several times in recent history and how big technology firms, whether they are dealing with chemicals, genetics, or machinery have been very active in exploiting the food system. Far from being politically neutral, technology, as we all know, is always introduced within an ideological framing and advanced by powerful players who use it as a lever to shift or retain power in the food systems and overpopulation. As it was for industrial chemistry pioneers in the last century that brought us damaging um, agrochemicals, so it is today for data colonialists who smell profit in the fields and fishing grounds. The power vested in technology to transform the global economic system has never been greater. The exponential technological changes that come with the so-called fourth industrial revolution have the potential to upturn all economic sectors, including food and agriculture. Our essay argues that any alternative to this corporate-led technological food future will have to contain strategies to counter this tsunami and challenge the, ideolo the ideologies behind it. These alternatives must center the interest and life center the interest and livelihood of peasant farmers, small, small uh, farm holders and indigenous communities who feed 70% of the world's population but have been perennially, perennially pushed to the margins by previous technological waves and their disruptive consequences for the food system. We also discuss how the COVID pandemic has accelerated the rise of a global resource grab in our food and agriculture system. Then encompassing digitalization of, it, of the food system's core ecological and social components is, is a new means of making vast profits for tech corporations. Approaches that claim precision and efficient resources are in fact forms of power grab by data colossus. To develop alternatives to a corporate controlled port industrial revolution and regain control over food and agriculture futures, we assert 
that peasant farmers' sovereignty over data, promote agroecology and bottom-up technologies, and to build a comprehensive global system of participatory technology. Thanks, Gifty. Thank you so much, Ned. Uh, next up, we are joined by Yokling, the Director of Programs at the Third World Network. She talks to us about her upcoming essay, Wither a Global Data Governance Architecture, Lessons from the Biodiversity Discourse. Uh, over to you, Yokling. I, uh, this paper actually draws on the work that uh, my colleagues and I in the Third World Network have been working on. Uh, those at the biodiversity tracks, uh, those working on intellectual property, which is probably the most biggest, the biggest form of uh, legal enclosure of nature uh, and ideas uh, through a monopoly granted uh, through patents, trade secrets, copyright, etc. So uh, basically, we uh, this paper is uh, we discuss really what are the experiences, and we know all of us have been working on these issues. That biological resources have long been a contested area. Are they common for everyone? Do the state have absolute uh, uh, authority over these resources? Are they the domain of indigenous peoples and local communities who for millennia have been the stewards of biodiversity, using them sustainably and sustaining the conservation as well? So these are not new questions. Uh, and the parallels that we see with the data discussion today, the governance of data has really been fought out for 30 to 40 years. So the paper highlights how we have certain international instruments, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, and its trial, the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. The FAO has its own treaty also on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, all of which looked at the principles of equity, uh, historical responsibility, and that the state is not the main player or the only player, that we cannot resolve issues around um, resources uh, without looking at the people involved. So the CBD or the Convention on Biological Diversity is very important and instrument for us to actually learn from. Because there at the table on issues related to traditional knowledge, practices and innovations of indigenous peoples and local communities, they are at the table, they are part of the governance. It did not really start from a strong provision in the treaty, but through a lot of advocacy of indigenous peoples organizations, civil society groups and our partners in governments, we have come together to through the decisions of the governments in the treaty on biological diversity and the practices actually evolve a governance system that actually have lessons for us to learn from. However, at the same time, in the parallel 1990s, we also had the, uh, led by Pfizer, actually, the big, one of the biggest pharmaceutical giants, they actually globalized one Supreme Court decision in the United States, therefore, where five out of nine judges agreed that you can grant a patent, private ownership over a microorganism that has been modified to clean up our spills. That opened the whole world of globalization of private ownership, patents especially, over microorganisms and where we are today, fast forward to the pandemic and COVID-19, we are fighting over data that is digital information linked to a virus that links to diagnostic kits, that links to vaccines and all the medicines that we are working on. So this paper actually focuses on microorganisms in public health and also very important for agricultural industrial users. And what we have today is really a pushback that's needed. Because, all right, very quickly, this morning, I just read a newspaper report that said that MIT has actually come up with an AI algorithm that can collecting 7,000 of, uh, of cough samples that you can get an app if it's approved and you can tell whether a person has COVID or not. Now that is using data in a very dangerous way with no accountability. So our conclusion in our paper is that we have to act together, whether it's decentralization, what is global good is not centralized from the top, but it's a global access, but very networks of creation and research and also decentralized production. A lot of what we've been hearing about community hubs uh, and trust over data, we need to bring all those experiences together through the diversity that JustNet Coalition and many partners have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yukling. Uh, next up, we have Amber Sinha joining us, the, the, the Executive Director of the Center for Internet and Society. I invite him to share from his piece on Beyond Public Squares, Dumb Conduits and Gatekeepers, the need for a new legal metaphor for social media. Over to you, Amber. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking the organizers for this opportunity to contribute to such a thought-provoking compendium on how we may reimagine the global digital ecosystem. Uh, my essay focuses on the central role that social networking sites have come to play in our everyday digital lives and in democratic discourse itself. Now, the, the vision for social media as 
as a democratizing actor was based on on the ideal that it would be an open egalitarian space and and it that and that it could enable genuine public driven engagement a few years back google news facebook's news feed uh, which would try to put together a dynamic feed for both personal and global stories and twitter's trending hashtag feature looked poised to be the key drivers of an emerging news ecosystem and initially this new media was hailed as a natural consequence of of the internet and it would enable greater public participation it would allow citizen journalists and it would allow readers to engage directly uh, with different actors uh, but over a period of just a few short years it has become evident that far from being open or egalitarian social media platforms introduce their own very specific techno commercial curation of how information is accessed and this can often amplify and not necessarily lessen the issues that plagued mainstream media for a for a, for a thriving democratic society individuals need to be active participants in discourse and not merely passive recipients of information but social media platforms view users primarily as consumers and not as citizens and this uh, and their sort of single minded drive to appeal to a basest and narrowest set of stimuli uh, often makes good business sense for them but does no favors to the cause of democracy so in in stark contrast to the early utopian visions of of which which imagined the, that the internet would create a more informed public citizenry and democratize media what we see now is the growing association of social media networking websites with political polarization and the entrenchment of racism homophobia and xenophobia so th there is uh, at another level a dire need to rethink the regulatory strategies uh, that we used to deal with social media and look beyond the dumb conduit metaphors uh, that we have used so far that justify the safe harbor protection uh, to all internet intermediaries including social networking sites so alongside it's also important to critically analyze the outcomes of the regulatory steps that we must take in a way that they don't adversely impact free speech and privacy both equally critical to the, the cause of a, yeah of a democracy so, uh, so by uh, in this essay what i try to do is i survey the potential analogies that have been used to uh, to legally look at uh, different kinds of media and broadcasting networks with so the analogies of company towns common carriers and editorial functions and then uh, provide an early blueprint for how we may envision differentiated intermediary liability rules to govern social networking sites in a responsive manner thank you thank you so much ambar i now move on to uh, our next speaker who is mariana valente she is director of internet lab uh, and she joins us today on behalf of herself and co-author natalie fragoso uh, to share highlights from her essay on data rights and collective needs a new framework for social protection in a digitized world mariana you have the stage thank you deepti i'm very honored to be here and i'd also like to acknowledge the leadership of it for change in this field of justice in the digital world so me and my brilliant colleague, Natalie Fragoso, we've written about social protection and data justice. It's an emerging research and activist field that looks into the consequences of datifying social policies for citizens. Datifying data policies as in data and algorithms becoming central to the development of these policies and especially decision-making in these policies. And of course, data can support social justice, for example, in helping identifying vulnerable territories, um, what data justice perspectives are looking into now, uh, however, is how um, data, datafication can also produce new injustices through, for example, exclusion, unfair treatment, discrimination, control, and also harming autonomy and participation. Um, one of the things we, we speak of is how through datafication, citizens become legible and visible to the state in specific ways, and that 
without data rights and a data justice framework that can serve different ends. So we addressed a few examples around the world where the intensive use of data, algorithms, biometrics, and other forms of digital personal identification have led to injustices. And we have also drawn on our own research about the Bolsa Familia program, which is the largest welfare program in the world based in Brazil, and how it has not addressed data rights along the chain of collection and treatment of data for decision making around who makes for beneficiaries. And two things are especially important there. One mm -hmm. is that when associated with practices of producing control over specific populations, it produces gendered forms of control over the lives of women, who are the large majority of beneficiaries. And the other is that when allied with austerity policies, which have been the dominant horizon since 2016 in Brazil, this phenomenon is very closely tied to shrinking the programs and highlighting its focalized aspects or the misplaced idea that fraud is predominant and that data and algorithms should primarily support finding inclusion errors, which the literature shows that builds a constant struggle to, build to, be, to prove to be poor. So I invite you to read our piece. I would just conclude by saying that data justice is a call for bringing justice first, that a transnational framework of ju data justice is needed, one that goes beyond international frameworks for privacy and data protection, although there are a practical moment of this, and other solutions and other ideas are there on our paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. Uh, next up, we have Kate Lappin, Asia Pacific Region Secretary for Public Services International. For this project, Kate participated in a virtual parlay with Sofia Scassera, whom you had the opportunity to hear before. I invite Kate to share with us some highlights from this conversation, which was titled Reimagining a Social Contract for Labor in the Digital World. Kate, uh, please uh, go, go on. Great. Um, thanks, Dipti. Uh, and thanks for inviting us to contribute. As you mentioned, this is more of a, a conversation um, between Sophia and myself and the, the challenges that we see in the trade union movement and across the two regions, uh, across Latin America and Asia Pacific. Um, and the ways that trade unions have started, at least, to think about the impact that big tech has on workers, and in our case, also on public services. Um, and so we've tried to start that conversation um, by asking the, the first question, what is, what is the impact of big tech, their monopolies, on decent work, but also on the on the social contract that workers fought for, you know, um, mm. over the last century, because I the the business model that big tech is based on is basically the ability to rewrite the rules um, that allow them to construct the fiction that workers are are not employees to start with. And they've created that fiction, of course, that workers are unentitled, therefore, to, to minimum wage, to, to hourly rates, to, um, to sick, pay, sick pay and um, other key provisions that would constitute decent work. They've also um, introduced monitoring, of course, of workers in new ways and been able to produce produce large amounts of data about workers that they're there and they're, that they are excluded from. And of course, as mentioned earlier, that can often discriminate and trade unions, uh, trade, trade rules are preventing trade unions from being able to demonstrate uh, discrimination when it occurs because uh, you know, we can't have access to the algorithms to prove that discrimination. Um, but trade rules have also been able to assist big tech in their in the way that they have rewritten the the um, social contract for contributing uh, to to the state so they aid in the tax avoidance that big tech um, is notorious for and of course that is one way to undermine public services in uh, for part of the contribution uh, that I've made on behalf of PSI is also to think about that impact, the impact that big tech is having on public services by both capturing the metadata that public services need and by increasingly moving in to deliver those services even where it remains public and by uh, shutting out the 
a public option in all areas really but with I, I sure um starting to think about health services and some of that you clean mentioned and some of the other key areas that would undermine our capacity to to both organize and deliver public services lastly we've really tried to focus on what the alternatives are what the alternatives are for the da uh, data commons but also for the trade union movement and i think this conversation that it for change and the just net coalition is facilitating is part of helping us as a union movement and as Sophia said earlier um, to tackle these questions both in terms of what what are the alternatives that we need but also how do we organize and what are the coalitions who are the um, allies that we need to build the power to confront big tech and to shape an alternative thank you so much uh, Kate uh, next up, we have Roberto Visio, co-editor of the Global Pol Policy Watch. I call upon him to share his views from his essay on the coming shift in internet governance. Over to you, Robert Roberto. Hi, thanks so much. It's really very exciting to be part of this conversation where so many ideas have been already brought up. And I want to focus in one piece which is about the legal basis of all this problem that we are having from the uh, social media and its impact, uh, which is completely the contrary to the original idea of democratizing that was the hope and the promise um, to uh, the platforms that are changing and destroying the social relations, the way we work, uh, as was also described. And actually, in a similar way as to how Joe Kling was explaining that a court decision determined that life could be patented and that changed the, the whole world in many aspects. At, in the year 96, when the internet had just been open for greed and business activities there was a tiny law in the u.s a very controversial law in a way communications and decency act which is a law that was in most aspects later repealed because being a communication and decency law it was actually limiting freedom of information but that law had a very little section, an article that basically said that electronic service providers could have their cake and eat it. And that is the whole basis of the gig economy and the social media platforms. What do I mean with that? What well, that section 230, which is still valid today, said was that if you are a media uh, um, electronic service provider, you are exempted from the liability that publishers have. And uh, you can publish anything you want without having any liability for it. Now, you know, there is a technology first developed in Korea and China that changed the world, which is the movable type technology that gave us this gadget that changed the world for good, for democracy, for literacy, but also created wars in Europe uh, between the okay. Protestants and yeah. the Catholics, yes? Could I request you to wrap up, please? Oh. Well, the wrap up is that the publisher responsibilities that section 230 exempts does not only apply to Facebook or Twitter, but it also makes Uber and Airbnb possible by saying we are just information intermediaries and not a taxi company or not an hotel company. And therefore we don't have the responsibilities that these people have. Now, the good news is one that in the US this is being challenged. 
both Trump and Biden challenged Section 230 for opposite uh, reasons. Trump, because it allowed Twitter to censor him. Biden, because it allows Facebook to carry uh, whatever the president says without any checking of his responsibility, which are actually both aspects of Section 230. So this is going to come under revision, and I think it will be a very important debate. Of course, here, this is a US law and a US political process which of course expands all over the world because the US owns the internet, <laughs> which is something which I discuss in my article. But the good news also is, and I finish in 30 seconds, that developing countries, every country in fact, has a lot more power than what they think to control those platforms. And that power lies in the central banks. And that power lies in the way that credit cards are or not allowed to make payment without paying taxes or uh, without all this uh, fiction of exceptionality that has allowed these corporations to prosper. Governments that have a political will, as happened in my own small country, Uruguay, when they wanted to control Uber and you know, make them pay uh, taxes and ensure social security for their workers, they can do it so very easily because all these companies rely on is credit cards for the payments you know and if that power is not exercised is because there is lobbying complicity or you know pressure from the corporations to which governments are quite vulnerable but you don't need we don't need to expect a big change in the us to make those things start to change. It is a law uh, internal of the US that Europe later copied. It can be undone. It is not a technological necessity. Uh, thank you. Stop. Thank you so much, Roberto. I now am happy to invite uh, Jun Itan, an independent researcher based in Malaysia, currently working on the topic of AI governance in Southeast Asia. I ask her to share some highlights from her piece on imagining the AI we want towards a new AI constitutionalism. Over to you, Shun. Uh, thank you, Dikti. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Hello? We can hear yes, you. Okay. Uh, so AI technologies uh, promise vast benefits to society, but also bring unprecedented risks when abuse are misused. So in recent years, we have seen a movement towards AI constitutionalism, where stakeholders from groups articulate uh, values and principles in building, deploying, and using AI, coming up with declarations, charters, guidelines, and so on. So in my essay, I outline the current state of AI constitutionalism by drawing from academic research on existing ethical guidelines and value statements. So they point out that current discourses and initiatives center on non-legally binding AI ethics that are overly narrow and technical in their substance, and they also overlook systemic and structural concerns, which we all know. So uh, initiatives on norm-making are dominated by small and privileged groups in the global north and reflect their interests and priorities with little consultation from those affected by the technologies. So in placing AI constitutionalism back into the application layer, and its societal and local context, I suggest that three principles should guide future initiatives. So firstly, AI must be viewed as a means instead of an end with an emphasis on clarifying objectives and analyzing the feasibility of the technology in providing solutions. For example, ob uh, objectives can um, draw from existing global aspirations, such as the UN SDGs, which have gone through extensive consultation and negotiations. So there should also be uh, room to reject the use of AI if societal risks outweigh benefits. So secondly, AI ethics must emphasize relationality and context, moving away from an individualist and rationalistic um, paradigm. So philosophies from many non-Western cultures, such as uh, Ubuntu, Confucianism, um, and indigenous epistemologies do view um, ethical behavior in the context of social relationships and relationships between humans and the world. So, for example, when we use the ethical framework of Ubuntu to 
evaluate uh, automated decision making systems, some negative impacts such as exclusion of marginalized communities or exacerbation of social inequalities become quite clear, um, which is something that AI ethics, as it currently is, does not address. So, lastly, AI governance must, must go beyond self regulation by the industry, supported by checks and balances, institutional frameworks, and regulatory environments arrived at with participatory processes at different policy levels, be it um, local, sectoral, national, or international. So the advances promised by AI will only be realized if we collectively deliberate on our AI-enabled futures and steer it carefully, and we cannot afford to drift along with the current discourses of AI ethics. We need to bring it back to the application and societally. With that, thank you for attention. Thank you so much, uh, Jun. I bring on today uh, for this session our last speaker. We are joined by Amba Kak, who is Director of Global Policy and Programs at New York University's AI Now Institute. She shares some thoughts from her upcoming essay, uh, Pandemic is a Portal to the Future of AI Governance. Amba, you're on. Hi, thank you, Deepti, Anita, Suhail, and, and the whole team. Um, my paper is called Pandemic as a Portal to the Future of AI Governance. Uh, I sort of combed through the developments of the last year to identify certain provocations and also conceptual tools that can help think through the sort of space or field of algorithmic accountability and more broadly, the political economy of AI systems. Um, the four provocations I offer are understanding AI as an abstraction, understanding AI as an a distraction, understanding AI policy as infrastructure policy, and understanding accountability beyond the lens of privacy. So the first, and I'll give a sort of elevator pitch version, uh, the first is to understand AI as an abstraction. I argue that the kind of decontextualized uh, data visualizations and statistics uh, about the pandemic have allowed these kind of universal narratives about how the pandemic doesn't discriminate to proliferate. And I argue that just as the you know statistics can obscure the unequal impacts and the governance failures that we've seen during the pandemic, AI as an abstract buzzword is also brandished in a very similar way against um, complex socioeconomic problems. Uh, and more specifically looking to the future, I argue that the boundary wars of what counts as AI is currently being fought by all kinds of vested interests from the technical sector and, and businesses. But I think that those that are involved in advocacy and policy also need to pay attention to defining and grounding AI as a term, as a kind of key step towards de-abstraction. And one immediate tactic that I offer is kind of drawing attention to the redefining AI as algorithmic decision systems. This is not new, it's a term that's um, been gathering currency, but I argue that it will help make that shift from this abstract understanding of intelligence to systems, socio-technical systems that make decisions, allocate resources, prioritize and engage very importantly in value trade-offs. Secondly, the kind of AI as distraction, I, I won't get into it, but here I draw from the debate on contact tracing to ask what do we lose in the hype and what are technological systems distracting from? And um, when it comes to AI, I, I give, I'm gonna repeat it here because it's short, just one example from Michigan State in the US where an algorithmic system in 2013 uh, replaced the manual in unemployment insurance system. The, the system was found later to be in error 92% of the time, which means that people were declared to be fraudulently asking for unemployment uh, assurance. And so you can analyze the data, you can analyze the machine learning algorithms that were used, but the most important context um, that you need to know for this case was that there had been a government change and that, that Governor Rick Snyder had been kind of intensely pushing back against all forms of state welfare. So I use this as an example to say that AI and technical systems are often being used as a way to disguise austerity and other forms of neoliberal governance that are baked into the design of the system. So 92% false claimants was a feature, not a bug. Um, and I argue that algorithmic impact assessments and audits need to be constructed so that they surface political and economic motivations rather than evaluate technical components in isolation. And finally, I, I know I'm probably hitting the time, but the final one is on AI policy as infrastructure policy. So people have, have already said this much better than I have, but 
this pandemic has revealed AI as, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, the private technology companies as infrastructure. And I argue that this kind of material and infrastructural turn in the discourse is 100% a good thing. It is critical. It has already been a foot in AI policy. But the reason why, at least the space that my organization is part of, a lot of organizations only refer to AI ethics as being where AI policy is happening is because data governance and, data and competition has never been seen as industrial policy. And I argue that they absolutely are. And all of these policies are essentially controlling access to the inputs that will be required for the AI computing landscape from data to algorithms, to computing power, to chipsets, uh, to expertise. Yeah, thank you, uh, Amba. Yeah, sorry to cut in. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers who've been here today. Uh, I welcome all of you to engage with the tremendous work that has been done uh, through this endeavor. We now move to part three, our concluding session of the day, uh, reflections from Professor Saskia Sassen, who of course does not need an introduction. Professor Saskia Sassen has been the foremost thought leader on globalization. Currently, she is Robert S. Lynn Professor of Sociology, Columbia University. Her books include Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy and Losing Control, Sovereignty in an Age of Globalization, among many others, which have been translated into over 20 languages. She's been a recipient of many awards, a Principe de Asturias 2013 prize in the social sciences and selected as one of the top 100 women in the sciences in 2018. I invite Professor Sassen now to take the stage. Could I request uh, somebody from the IT for Change to a team to check, Anushka and Deepti, if uh, Professor Sasen is on online? Yeah, she's online. Um, yes, is her mic working? Uh, her mic and as well as the video are, uh, I mean, working, but we can't hear you, Professor. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Your audio is mute, uh, Professor Sassen. We're not able to hear you, Professor Sassen, but... Um... Um, could you maybe please uh, type in chat? Uh... Professor, about any issue that you're facing, we can try and fix it. Adipti, my, my feeling is that she's not able to hear us either. Can someone unmute her? Someone with controls can unmute, unmute her? Someone with ha who has uh, uh, she's controls? unmuted, but I'll try to do she's it. She's unmuted. Again. Now she's yes. muted. Now you can unmute her. Yeah, just one second. Uh, professor, can you hear us? I think she can hear us, but we can't hear you. She's muted now. She's uh, muted now. Just one second. Can you say something? Uh, you're unmuted.
professor could you try a pair of earphones or headphones to speak into that mic maybe your device uh, is not unable to catch it hello professor please can you check up your mic we cannot hear you and if you can put any information that you want to be assisted on the chat platform we cannot hear you so please check your microphone your the settings which um, you can navigate go to where your mute section is then you you go to select which microphone you want to use if um so check on your computer that you have connected to then on where the mute section is you will, you will see a drop arrow key which goes up then check whether which of the mics that you can use to be loudable because we cannot hear you please Um, I will just check my mail. I think uh, Tanvi is right. She may not have joined with her uh, join audio. Oh yes, she's just written. Can somebody pull me into the meeting? Um, yeah. So Deepti, is there any mail from her? And uh, I don't see any other, I think. Uh... Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, no, I think she's still here. I can see her in our panelists list, uh, but yeah, I don't, uh, we'll try and get the source of start. Uh, yeah, now she's in again, Anushka. Could you? Yeah. Sir, could you say something if we want to check if we can hear you? Uh, uh, can you? Hello, Professor Sassen, would you unmute your mic and try uh, speaking?
Um, DP, I think on email, you have to ask her explicitly if she needs any assistance. Otherwise, I think um, uh, we are able to see her, but I'm not sure why her video and her audio are not working. Yeah, I'll just get on that. Yeah, please. Mute. Mute. Yeah, we can hear you, Professor Sassen. You can hear me? Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Okay, then let me just quickly, by now, let's reduce my talk to five minutes. <laughs> I can talk more, but you can hear me, right? Yes, you can talk as much as you want. Thank okay. you. So, so, so two or three elements. Um, one of them in, in, that I think is important for us to, to address, or at least in my own work. So one of them is that we have built knowledge silos that have worked very well uh, in terms of the specialized knowledges that is involved, you know, in many different subjects. Each subject has its own specialized knowledge format. And so it seems to me that we have arrived at a time, uh, and perhaps it has to do with having entered a new epoch, and that now these knowledge silos are beginning to fail us in the sense that they keep us from capturing what is happening at ground level and is marked by a certain type, perhaps a new type of transversality. Uh, in other words, that we can connect with very specific groups across the world in many very specific ways that we bypass most of what is happening possibly in our own societies, and that we know as much about partial elements of other societies as we know about our also increasingly partial knowledge of our own societies. In other words, enough innovations, enough transformations, enough new brutalities that have reduced the options of many people because we also have that going on, has created a sort of an ambiguous condition where our established rules, our established concepts can take us only so far. In that sense, when I speak about this notion of a kind of transversality, you know, where we cut across these knowledge silos, which means inevitably entering new terrain, and I mean terrain in, in many different ways. I don't mean just ground. I mean different forms of knowledge, different cultures. We are becoming global in many ways, even though it is a very partial globality. And so the question then becomes, how do we, especially we who work you know, in the social sciences, uh, in other words, we are also dealing with people, we are dealing with the innovations that people make, we are dealing with the brutalities that some actors exercise against other humans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it seems to me that, that the time has come, perhaps, at least for some of us, <laughs> I'm one of them, uh, to exit these knowledge silos and to go transversal, even if we cannot fully understand, like there are certain technical aspect in certain forms of engineering that I don't have a clue how that works. I could not read that or understand that. But at the same time, I know that that exists. And what I should know is when is that kind of knowledge that has nothing to do with the kind of knowledge that I have, when is that kind of knowledge, a knowledge that we should alert others about, we don't have to become experts on all of that. We cannot do that, or it just would be rather poor uh, knowledge that we would accumulate in that way. But that we are aware of these transversal connections. I think that a lot of very big businesses have benefited from these knowledge silos in ways that we, the researchers, we, the people, we, the modest laborers who are part of this story, uh, have not benefited from. And so in my call is a bit to exit the narrower sense of our specializations, not 
destroy those specializations. We need those specializations. But I would argue at least some of us need to go transversal. We need to cut across uh, a whole variety of, of divisions that we have now. That is not easy for us. But one positive element is that there are enough innovations that are being developed by young people, for instance, or people who are not part of a big corporation, that this signals to me that we have entered a kind of new zone for research. It doesn't eliminate at all the existing zones for research. It just adds a new element. And in that new element is a kind of, I would say, a move towards discovering rather than confirming. In other words, opening it up to forms of knowledge that, that we're not totally comfortable with, that will mean that we have to sort of, let's say, do our homework <laughs> about all these novel types of things. And that in that sense, we can gain something from each other that can build onto broader knowledge platforms that include specific, various, several specific forms of specialized knowledge, rather than leaving the specialized knowledge in its own silo, bring it onto some broader, into a broader zone where we can sort of participate. We're beginning to understand, for instance, to mention an extreme case, two extreme cases. One is that it, when it comes to extremely advanced knowledges, um, we cannot have full command over all of that. It's a multiplication of extreme knowledges. But we do want to have certain vectors that connect us. They connect us because there is a substantive reason to be connected. And in that sense, this transversality that I'm speaking about, rather than what we have lived with and still are living with to a very large extent, which is that you just develop expertise about a little, 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 little thing, but by God, you are the master of that domain. <laughs> I'm arguing that is not enough. Now, I think given the lateness of when I started talking and I see that it's headed in my clock at least to noon, I don't want to uh, use up another person's um, time for speaking. And so I would just uh, stop at this point. I would be happy to, to answer a few questions if you have them. And I apologize for having messed up uh, my entry into the, at this late stage. Thank you very much. Could you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Oh, good. Professor, Professor Sassen. Sassen. Something is something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah but, uh, we do have uh, some more time and if uh, there are questions we could take them but if you really want to touch upon the uh, thematic of uh, the digital and the fact that there are intersections uh, very clearly between conversations on the Green New Deal and the Digital New Deal, we would really be honored. Yeah, Anita, are you also allowing a question here? Yeah, please, please. I thought, uh, yeah, I yeah. thought uh, Professor Sassen will take uh, me up on that question, but we could uh, club all the questions. Kindly go on. No, I think uh, uh, what Professor spoke about in terms of the changed landscape of knowledge and intermingling of the, the spaces and the boundaries is exactly uh, in a practitioner's term, the challenge we as a coalition, which is a just net coalition, professor may not know, is a coalition of digital activists uh, who try to connect with different sectors and together to develop common inputs into digital policy and digital knowledge and try to interpret the digital knowledge to these sectors, whether it is health, agriculture, education, etc. And inversely, also take knowledge from how digital is impacting education, et cetera, to develop a new vocabulary of the yeah. common uh, uh, space of Hold the digital. 
so so the question is that how would you what would you suggest uh, for such a network uh, to do in terms of knowledge building but also advocacy uh, and uh, and research of course thank you would it uh, be possible for you to take on those questions at this point professor sasen can you hear me yes go ahead okay oh, fine. yes i completely agree with what you said and i think it is a challenge and i think it may mean that we we have to descend if you want go down every now and then but regularly to a lower level of complexity for instance i'm very interested in bringing in actors like farmers and uh and you know a whole variety of of where there is knowledge and there is knowledge that we need uh to to enable uh how do you know do you bring those people into because we we are seeing that more and more for instance in the whole agricultural field that you now have a bunch of growers etc who are often small enterprises but they are using the technology to the advantage let's say to put it very nicely of our health in other words better quality better done fresher uh, you know etc so that is just one example as a simple example but there are so many other uh, instantiations of a kind of simplicity that brings us down to ground level and that enables us to go transversal and in that transversality pick up utility functions forms of knowledge uh stuff that has to do with with um with a uh, with a uh, sort of certain types of technologies you know that we can begin to also be a bit masters of little domains not big domains but you know like i know that people who are interested in the whole food question in latin america and and other parts of the world they are literally learning from each other and they are inserting the technology in ways that that makes sense for them rather than whatever you know the originators of those technologies maybe had in mind and in that sense the whole tech aspect can become simple but extraordinarily effective for very specific actors or very specific conditions um so the the other vector of course in the whole tech bit is make it as complex as brilliant as astounding as etc and that's just great fun <laughs> and that's good it's good that we have that too but what if we could bring together small farmers you know very modest operations and have them benefit and that is of course happening huh uh also this whole notion how you can communicate with far away zones without having access to telephones and all of those traditional you know that that is something that is really happening certainly in countries like india you know and and a bit in latin america so so anyhow those are some observations i i should probably stop talking now if, if there is a question or so yes we have a question from francois solar um i would invite him to um, go ahead and frame it Yes, hi Saskia. Hi. Uh, you were talking about transversality. Yeah. And I think and I think many people and participants to this chat told that um a kind of new reframing of what is knowledge and technology is is that uh, is at the center of what happened on the digital continent. Something like that is happening, you know. Something like that so is my, happening. Yeah. Yes. and what what kind of uh, concrete or maybe pragmatic lines or suggestions would you envision in the grounds as you said of digital phenomenon or uh, digital transformation for example with the cities because i remember you yeah. a lot yeah. in the city 
that's a good that's a good case. For instance, in in a city like New York, and I'm sure that in many other cities in the United States. So I am also sure that that maybe not so much in 